Welcome to the Fandom Podcast Network special presentation of Time Warp 1987 Part 7. This is the 40th anniversary in movies and pop culture for 84 as of this recording here in 2024. And we are discussing the month of July of 1984. We are in the middle of the summer movie season. Uh, and of course, as I said, everything is celebrating its 40th anniversary as of this recording. And uh, we're talking about not just the movies, but also the pop culture, the music, and everything else that surrounded these movies that came out in July of 1984. My name is Kevin. I'll be your host, but I got to get my co-host on here. And with me, as always, our trivia master for the show as well, my brother from another mother, co-founder of the fandom podcast network i'd like to welcome mr kyle wagner what's going on dude good to see you let's get you on here first of all that helps <laughs> what's up buddy i come here in a very solemn matter in a very serious matter to discuss for this episode of time warp uh-oh uh-oh this time warp contains the most traumatic thing to ever happen to any child in 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 movie history and we, i just want to forewarn you that this may cause this episode could cause ptsd Yes, I know what you're talking about, and we're going to save that for later, and it'll be a big downer in the show when we do. <laughs> but uh, we can't do this show with, uh, without our uh, fellow co-host of Time Warp, the queen of movie foo, broadcasting live from her palatial video estate there. Please welcome Lacey Adderhold. What's going on? Hello. Not much. Not much. How y'all doing? doing good i'm still going through withdrawals of hanging out with you guys in person uh watching movies in your place there lacy uh, a few weeks ago of course uh we all met up in uh georgia it was great you played host to us we had a great time and i miss you guys in person when you coming back i got bedrooms <laughs> Well, you know what? Uh, yes, we're going to have to plan that. We are, of course, talking uh, Time Warp movies of 1984. And there's a picture of us all hanging out in your uh, video library room. Love that. Love that. Uh, so, yeah, this is the Fandom Podcast Network. Uh, guys, we're talking Time Warp again. Um, re, you know, visiting the year of 1984, which had a lot of great films, a lot of cult favorites as well. And some not so good ones. And we'll get into uh, maybe one or two of those there. But there is some stuff that is coming up on Time Warp that we did want to mention. Uh, coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, as you know, we celebrate all kinds of fandoms here on the Fandom Podcast Network. And uh, one of the fandoms is, of course, uh, football. And uh, being a fan of the Raiders myself, uh, a lot of former Raider players made their mark in movies and television, as well as some other non-Raider uh, players as well. But the Raiders have a certain niche in Hollywood history and uh, are going to have my good friend Murph from Raiders Fan Radio come on to discuss this, as well as author and fellow Raider fan, Rich Smelter, who also is uh, the ra uh, writer for the Raiders Encyclopedia, but he's also a big movie fan. He also just released a book about Marilyn Monroe, the uh, original influencer and a, a good, uh, great book on B movies and drive-in movies as well. So I consider him a film expert and he's going to come on and join us for that for a live show. Yes, Lacey. Are you going to have the links for those somewhere? Because I'm interested in both of those books now. <laughs> yes, I will have that on the show. And uh, yeah, you can also look him up on Amazon, uh, Richard J. Schmelter, and you'll see his books on there. Okay. And uh, he covers, obviously, non-Raider stuff as well. And uh, he knows his stuff. He's a great and big movie nerd. And that's one of the reasons why he's going to come on there. So, yeah, good stuff. Uh, and the, one of the ones that, I, that he wrote that I like is the Championship Diary from the 83-84 uh, Championship uh, series that the Raiders had there as well. But we also have been, uh, last year, of course, we did do a Buffy retrospective. That was a lot of fun on Time Warp. Make sure you check that out. And as we are discussing 1984, we started, of course, turning this into a monthly show. It has been a blast and we've covered a lot of great hits here. If you are uh, listening to the audio podcast, make sure you check out the video on YouTube because we're showing all the slides of the movies that we have done. And uh, last year, last week uh, or last month, excuse me, last couple of months, the summer movie season of 84 started. We had Indiana Jones, the Breakin series started ghostbusters, natural karate kid gremlins, top secret, bachelor party we had a lot of stuff uh coming in through the uh, uh season here in uh summer of 84 and this month is of course uh no argument here we got a lot of stuff that we're going to be touching on and i'm excited about that now i want to ask you kyle you shared something and i'm going to tease it actually on a future show about uh this possibly being one of the best summer movie seasons of the 80s 
And you shared that with me. And I'm going to share that information later because we're not done with the summer movie season. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I think we made a case for 82 or 83 as well. We we did. But I, I, honestly, when you go back and look at the movies that are in the summer of 1984, there are so many, not just important films, but films that are in the lexicon going forward. I mean, films that you just you don't you just have to say a name and people just immediately know it. They've seen it. They've introduced it to generations. And franchise I think franchise films, what, right? Yeah. yeah, right. Well, not not even just franchise films. Even some standalone films that just have stood that withstood the test of time from 1984. And I I I just think I think the summer of 1984 films might be the summer that shows the culture of what's going on in the world and especially in the United States during that time more than any other summer of movies ever. I, I truly, I truly that, believe that. That's an excellent point, Kyle, because I was 13 going on 14 during this time. And I was uh, going to the theaters a lot more during this time as well. I was rewatching a lot of these films and of course, you know, dating and girls were on mine. Some of these might've been some, you know, chaperone dates so to speak you know and little things like that uh lacy you're a few years younger but what did 84 mean to you going into this summer um you know my my dad was always big into you know star trek and star wars and all that you know that kind of thing so i got a lot of my film love from my dad um and we would do they all we always had the the drive-in you know there were there were two big like kind of major drive-ins in atlanta back in the back in the day and um we would do the drive-in movie, you know, every other weekend or something. Well, at least it feels that way. I don't know. I'd have to probably check and see. Maybe I'm over, over remembering. But you know, I remember going to the drive-in all the time with my parents um, to watch yeah. all the things. And the best thing in the '80s at the drive-in was watching ET and watching them in like at the drive-in and thinking that they were going to go off the screen. Right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, I, yeah. you know what? You, I was turning. I was. I was ten, eleven. I would be eleven at the end of July. Drive-ins were a big deal. I'm glad you brought that up. They, you know, obviously they've been around for a long time, but I felt yeah. like this was like a resurgence of drive-ins because mm -hmm. it was cheaper and it was also a lot of people around the country that might have been their only theater to closely go to as well because they were popping up yeah. everywhere. Kyle, did you have a drive-in up there in Alaska that you went to? No, no drive-in. What they would do, though, is there's one place where, like, once a summer they do one drive, like a one-night drive-in movie. The problem was it never got dark in the summertime. <laughs> well, that makes sense, Sam. Oh, duh, on Kevin. <laughs> well said, well said. Well, uh, we are discussing the movies of 1984, uh, and uh, we got a lot to get in here. And I'm excited. But uh, you know what? Let's uh, First of all, let's take a step back into 1984 let's fuel up the delorean uh with that flux capacitor slingshot around the sun aboard a captured klingon bird of prey take a step into that blue police box or phone booth or step into that quantum leap accelerator or take a dip in that hot tub time machine as we travel back to 1984 and we're going to remind you what was happening in pop culture sports politics television and of course the movies of 1984 <laughs> All right, let's get into some world news here, guys. Uh, we've uh, we you know we've gone over a lot of the stuff with Costa in earlier shows and stuff, but we had a little bit of world news, interesting stuff here, and, and some bad news. And I remember this too as well. Uh, first of all, bad news for some people: <laughs> the National uh, Minimum Drinking Age Act is passed in America. Those under the age of twenty-one can't buy or possess alcohol. Before the act is passed, the legal drinking age varied from eighteen to twenty-one, depending on which American state you were in. Guys, I don't remember this being. Of course, I was underage no matter what, but I don't remember this being a big deal or I didn't remember this. I just thought I was always 21. Do you guys remember this? I remember it being a big deal for Louisiana because Louisiana was like, nope, not doing that. And yeah. so the federal government said, well, then we're not going to fix your roads, which is why still to this day, Louisiana has the worst roads ever, uh, even though like a few years later, they finally, um, you know, submitted or whatever. Um, yeah. Kyle, I had a question for you. I heard that there is no drinking age up in Alaska because they want to try to keep everyone warm. Even babies are getting drunk. Is that true? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, they just Jack Daniels right into the bottle. It's all good. No, I actually remember this was a pretty big deal. And I remember it being a big deal too because 
it was one of those things where a lot of states were arguing how dare our government tell us what to what to do you know yeah. in our states and our state laws and because um you know like taxation on alcohol and stuff was a big money thing for a lot of states and you know they wanted those younger younger drinkers to get that much more because hey those college kids what do they spend their money on alcohol this is true <laughs> Uh, on July 18th, the first female captain of a Boeing 747, Beverly Burns, makes her maiden voyage as captain. And I was d debating whether or not to put this in here, but this was my first experience to uh, basically a mass shooting. Uh, and this happened in San Diego. I was growing up in Santa Barbara. On July 18th, San Ysidro McDonald's massacre happens in San Diego, California, California declared the deadliest shooting by a single gunman at the time. James Oliver Huberty, 41, kills 21 people and injures 19. Huberty is killed by a police sniper who is deployed to a rooftop opposite the fast food restaurant. Uh, yeah, this this is when I started realizing that um, U.S. was not a safe world. Uh, I had seen other, of course, you know, you know, Cold War stuff. And we obviously we had the nuclear possibility and all that kind of stuff. But this is where it hits home. And I remember, you know, when you look, when you open up like the Sunday newspaper and the newspaper and you're looking for the comics, this was plastered all over the place. Pictures were everywhere. Do you guys remember this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, Lacey. Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, hmm. it was I happening remember, at a McDonald's, which was yeah, like supposed to be that, a safe place. That was the big thing is because I, I want to say the Kent State shooting had happened, what, 15 years earlier? Yeah. Maybe. And so the 60s. it wasn't, I mean, because I, so I, for some reason, I remembered there being conversation about how this was, you know, getting worse, not, not yeah. something new. It was like, it was, I remember there being conversation around teachers or parents or, you know, the adults yeah. talking about it and how, you know, if, if it could happen at a McDonald's, you know, kind of a thing. It was, it was. And, I remember seeing some graphic pictures taken by the press too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I don't want to describe them now, but uh, it's, I thought it was important to mention because mm -hmm. we all, we always remember, you know, and unfortunately now it's a common situation here in the States. It's yeah. uh, but this, this is one of the, you know, Kyle, do you remember this one at all? I, I rem remember, but not a whole lot. This is again, growing up in Alaska at this time where you're kind of isolated from what's happening sometimes in the lower 48, you get, you get the news and you get that, but you don't get that full necessary blasted in your face coverage that yeah. you normally would. Um, I, I know it was a little bit more of a big deal in my household just because of what my dad being a police officer, because there was high alerts on a lot of things when something like this happens. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, yeah. I do remember that. Like you guys said, it, it was the fact that it happened of where it happened. It's happening at a McDonald's, which, yeah. you know, we, we assume it's a safe place, but it's also McDonald's and it's where a lot of people go. So it, it was, it was a really weird mental state for a lot of people for a while. Yeah. They ended up, they ended up having to take down that McDonald's and uh, I don't know, I don't know what it is now, but that McDonald's does not exist there, unfortunately. Did, but uh, uh, did you, were there McDonald's in Alaska at the time? I mean, had, McDonald's oh yeah, we have McDonald's. Yeah, we, we, we have McDonald's. Okay. Well, on happier news, uh, later in the month, July 28th, the Summer Olympic Games open up in Los Angeles, California. Despite the Soviet boycott, a record-breaking 140 nations take part. This was a big deal for me personally. Uh, watching the Olympics every four years in the family intelligence was a big deal, but it being close to us. And also, too, uh, we had the uh, uh, the canoe or the kayaking or whatever it was that was part of it uh, within driving distance of us uh, in Ojai. Huh. And then we, I think we had, it wasn't official, but we had a demonstration, I think, of like windsurfing for the Olympic Committee as well, Kyle, I think. Well, the most important thing about this was because of the Russian boycott, uh, Krusty Burger had to declare bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Mary Lou Retton era too, guys, if I remember correctly. It was huge. It was at the, uh, the oh, Krusty Burger. Nice call out, by the way. <laughs> uh, Lacey, uh, you remember the Olympics uh, hitting you there, um, uh, you know, in the South while uh, it was happening all in Los Angeles? You know, there's something of, I, I am not a sports person. I'm not a competitive person. So for me, the only thing that like hit my radar when the Olympics came every four years was that summer TV, there weren't going to be any hiatus TV shows. And I was always so bummed. Um, because nobody wanted to compete with the ratings for, on what was it? Probably channel 11 back then. I think it recently changed to channel 
uh, well, to ABC. It used to be NBC. Um, but I just remember every every four years going, oh, man, it's the Olympics. Oh, you, summer TV you know, it's stuck. You know, and it's funny. All, and the thing is, it's also the same year every year. The Olympics are the same year as the election. So now we have crappy TV over the summer, and then we're just going to be smacking it in the face of the election after this. And it's just going to be nuts. I'm going to bring up the preempt did stuff with uh, uh, the Olympics because I remember that happening as well. You know, like, stop it. I want to watch my show. So I'll, I'll, we'll be bringing that up. How dare you I, preempt the Dukes of Hazard <laughs> and Riptide? <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have uh, Born in 84. We pick a group of uh, uh, celebrities that are born in the month of July of 84. And we have Johnny Weir, figure skater, fashion designer, and television commentator, uh, actor Matt Cook, uh, director, screenwriter, and actor Alex Ross Perry, actress, writer, and producer Emily Axford, actress Grace Byers, actress uh, Taylor Schilling, actress and producer Gina Rodriguez, and actress Gabrielle Christian. Uh, I literally also... only recognize one person on that list. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's uh, if you're born in 84 of July, you're not that famous, <laughs> but I love Gina Rodriguez, she's amazing. Uh, next, we do have some people that passed away uh, mm -hmm. in um, 84. And, uh, you know, it's hard to come up with some of these names. I, you know, don't know all these, but Dame Flora Robertson, English actress Carl Wolf, the German Nazi SS officer. He got his up and coming there. Big Mama Thornton, uh, American singer. George Gallup, American uh, statistician and opinion pollster. I think I know that guy because you always hear about Gallup polls. Well, George Gallup passed away uh, in 1984. He was born in 1901, so there you wow. go. James Mason, I know who that guy is. English actor, of course, he passed away on July 27th. And Bess Bowers, uh, American actress, uh, also passed away. So, all right. Next, we have 84 Tech, guys. we got a couple of them here, all right? First of all, we have the Epoch Game Pocket Computer, uh, a Japanese uh, item here <laughs> released by Epcot. Ep Epoch uh, Company in Japan in 84. Uh, it is also known as the Poke Pokecon, Pokecon, P O K E K O N. It was one of the very few truly handheld systems to be released in the early 80s, preceded by the Game Boy uh, five years later. The system was a commercial failure in Japan, and as a result, only five games were made for it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Took uh, four AA batteries. Uh, yeah, and apparently they're very, very hard, and they go for hard to find. They're very expensive on eBay if you can find them. Before I go to the next product, there. Oh yeah, Lacey, go ahead. I just want to say that when when it when the the slide popped up, I was just I just read the title to it, which says Epic Game Pocket Computer and HB LaserJet Printer, and I thought, wow, they had a pocket thing that was also a printer. <laughs> and it just took me a second to realize that that was not because that's something that's so. Like back in the 80s, everything had like a dual purpose. So it would not have yeah. shocked me. Like it was like, oh, wow. And then I was like, oh, no, I'm just an idiot. It's okay. Kyle, do you remember this system? No, I bet it, it, I, I've, I've done some research on it. Yeah, this is one of the biggest flops of Japanese video game systems ever. It didn't even make the US. I mean, it was like, it, it was bad. Apparently, to at least uh, Wiki, it says that uh, in Japan, uh, it cost 12 thousand eight hundred yen i don't know what that is in in uh, u.s dollars but definitely more but, now if you can find it well, let's just be honest handheld gaming officially didn't begin until nintendo put out the game boy true yeah yeah because <laughs> they did they did it well uh as lacy mentioned here the, we also have the hp laser jet printer uh uh first introduced in may of 84 at the computer dealers exhibition it was a 300 dpi 8 dpm printer that sold for $3,495, but then they reduced it to about $3,000 September of 85. Uh, this was kind of the beginning of the, the printer explosion here, guys. This is a big deal. Uh, the HP laser jet printer had high print quality, could print horizontally or vertically and produce graphics. Uh, and I think they're still running well nowadays, Kyle. If you can find the right adapters, yeah. I mean, this is this is really the first first printer to really kind of go from the dot matrix to a laser jet type cartridge. And I mean, come on, this thing was a freaking Ferrari, eight pages per minute it printed. <laughs> but you know what though? It it produced probably a secondary thing that might have become more popular is the printer repair person. Yes. <laughs> 
yeah. or trying to figure out how to change the ink. You know, it's just one of those things. So yeah, and they were they, they were what like twenty thousand pounds each. I don't know. Oh, I just, God. <laughs> they were so heavy. <laughs> Lacey. Two things you could always tell when someone was changing the ink is because their hand, their fingers, the ink. Back then, yeah. they weren't. Nothing was, you know, sealed, so you had to like push the thing, and it was every your fingers would come out black. Also, <laughs> twelve thousand yen is seventy five bucks. <laughs> seventy five bucks. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot more now, but thank you for that. That's cool. Cool. Next, we have toys. Oh, excuse me. No products first. We got products in eighty four, and I just got one for you this time. Velveeta ch uh, shells and cheese, and I like how one of the pictures here says uh, two percent milk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Velveeta shells and cheese is a shell pasta and cheese sauce food product that that debuted in the U.S. in eighty four as part of the Velveeta brand products. Its ingredients, texture, and flavor are very similar to macaroni and cheese. Uh, the product is shelf stable food. Craft food. Craft. Foods introduced Velveeta cheese products in 1927 after acquiring the brand from the Velveeta Cheese Company. Uh, Kraft had, uh, headquarters had previously located in Illinois. Kraft Foods were uh, made at around 160 manufacturing facilities around the world. Uh, this was a big deal, guys. I remember the Velveeta cheese. We uh, Later on, we kind of questioned like what was in it. But as kids, we didn't care. Kyle, did you have the Velveeta shells and cheese? I did not have the Velveeta shells and cheese because I was not a fan of the Velveeta shells and cheese. Really? Okay. I did. I thought it was good. What about you, Lacey? Um, I remember very clearly when they came out with the, like the, the diet brand, the diet version, because the 2% milk was based on the fact that the original had full fat milk. Right. And so the 2%, everybody like, like schools were saying, well, maybe we should switch to the, it was nuts. It was everywhere. It was everywhere. And I'm still sitting yeah. over here in the corner like, this is my craft macaroni and cheese. You back away. You back away. <laughs> like, my, like, still, I'm still like, I'm, I'm over 50 years old and I still, you know, a comfort food is sitting now with a little bit of, you know, yeah. powder, the, the, the orange, <laughs> like just the straight, regular, plain, original craft God. mac and cheese. Not now, I, now I now I want some shaped like Scooby Doo or Yoda. I just plain old. Darn it, Lacey, you're making me hungry right now for some Velveeta shells and cheese. So really Kyle's Kyle's really not rubbing his belly with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Next we have totally tubular '80s toys. We love uh, a little sample of toys here in '84, and we got three here. We got first of all the GoBot figure manufactured by Tonka. Price is $8.99. From Gobatron to Earth, the GoBots have landed. Disguised as ordinary Earth vehicles, these GoBots are staging their own fight. The friendly GoBots preventing the takeover of Earth and recapturing the escaped enemy robots. Choose from many different GoBots, including Baron Von Joy, the friendly robot sports car featured in this image. <laughs> Can I just I say, this just looks like a Transformer that gave up. Like, it looked like <laughs> he was just like, he was like... My wife left me, took the kids, the dog peed in my shoes this morning. I'm out. Like, he just doesn't care. This guy had the worst day. He lost his <laughs> battle with Megatron or whatever. And his wife was like, well, you can't even provide for us and left. And that is what happened to this. Okay, what, made, what makes it so funny that you said that, Lacey? Because Kyle and I have gone back and forth on the GoBot things because he teases me because I like GoBots. Okay. And he's a Transformers expert, and I think you've crystallized Kyle's point to the T. Would you agree with that, Kyle? <laughs> okay, so, so, so let me get into this for just one minute here, because GoBots did come out as Tonka's like answer to Transformers. That and... was not an answer. That was a suggestion that failed. <laughs> well, okay, so yes, this is a bad example picture of, of GoBots, because there were some pretty, actually pretty cool-looking GoBots, but they were... The, the thing about GoBots was, for the most part, they were, much, they were smaller and easier to transform, Hence why Kevin liked them so much. He less brain power required. But um <laughs> burn. <laughs> Kevin, you can let him say things like that. <laughs> I, I can't argue with any of those facts because he's correct. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love GoBots because okay, first of all, oh. when it comes to GoBots and Transformers, I always enjoyed the vehicle version of these characters more than what they transformed into. Because I love cars. I grew up loving cars with my dad and the GoBots, Yes. They were a lot easier to transform. But they also had cooler car and vehicle designs. 
And, but you know, and I actually would prefer to have this GoBot over a lot of Transformers because the car's so cool. And all you have to do is move like three pieces. And he's like this weird little stand-up version of the toy Transformer that, that failed, as you would say. Okay. I just have to say that the one that's in the picture, and I do, I know that a lot of people just listen, listen, but it's worth, seriously, this one photo is worth coming to the, to the video on this. It looks like that poor car is wearing like one of those red onesies that you know, <laughs> like for hunting and like black go-go boots. Like it's, uh. he's, he's, he is distressed fashion wise. He has some serious issues trying to figure well, out what this is. Baron Von joy, the friendly robot sports car. Come on. He's, I mean, just, he's, he, he's, he's grasping was, for eighties uh, fashion here. You can't, you can't fault him for that. If you put that sideways on its back to where it would look like Santa had just been murdered by a car and, and deflated. I just like how Kyle's <laughs> sitting back quiet going, Lacey, you go girl. No, I've been no, trying no. to well, make what? this point for years against Kevin, and you have yeah. just done it in two minutes. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'm just sitting back going, I can't believe we just had a three-minute conversation about GoBots. It's, right, just, well, it's hilarious. I mean, and again, look, I'm not one to tell anybody that they shouldn't like a toy or whatever. I don't care what you do or who you do it with or whatever. I Like, everyone's got their favorites, and everyone's got, you well, know, little things well, where everybody else is like, what? <laughs> well, so let's let's fine. get into the other two that yeah. we have pictured uh -huh. here. <laughs> We have, we have the, I have a headache from laughing. Okay. Uh, haunted house obstacle course game uh, went for twelve ninety nine. Can you, uh, you can clear, can you clear eight different obstacles to reach the top of the haunted house first? Uh, you race the clock to reach the top for one of your more, I got to find one of these for my wife, Aaron. I think she might dig that one. And last but certainly not least, we have the Imperial shuttle uh, star Wars toy from of course, Return of the Jedi, price $37.99. Journey with us together to another galaxy with Star Wars. Return of the Jedi, durable plastic toys. The Imperial Shuttle has laser sounds, open side panels, and automatic wings. I had trouble finding that thing, and it was a little pricey at the time. and Actually, kind of pricey now, actually. Kyle? So I, the thing about the Imperial Shuttle, too, was the scale of the Imperial Shuttle compared to the rest of everything else in Star Wars. Yeah, The Imperial Shuttle was a bigger toy than the Millennium Falcon. The wingspan, bro. <laughs> and it was tall. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, insane how big that, that ship was in comparison to everything else in the Star Wars line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was I'm impressive. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure my sister had that Halloween, uh, the uh, the haunted house thing, because her, her birthday was Halloween. And so that would have been like a perfect time frame. Like that. I, I actually I, like to look I that up. I remember that. I remember, like, because you had to, like, it was like a, it was like a, um, an upright pinball machine. So you'd yes. like press the button, it would go up to a certain spot, and then you'd have to press it, that button and it'd go up to another. Yeah. That looks cool. Yeah. I got to look that up. That thing looks really neat. Yeah. Right on. All right. Next uh, uh, subject we have here. We love talking 84 music, guys. And uh, <laughs> we got some interesting music news that's happening during the month of July. And one of the biggest here is July 7th, When Doves Cry hits the Billboard number one slot in the U.S. and stays there for five weeks, becoming the most successful song of the year. And I want to mention something that I recently found out, and I did not know this. Uh, if, the cover of the Purple Rain album uh, is very is an iconic look. You got Prince on, of course, as his purple motorcycle, and you got Vanity in the back there. Uh, up some steps there. It looks like an alley situation. I found out that that location you can find in the back lot tour if you look closely enough of the Universal Studios tour. And it's it's you don't necessarily see it when you're on the tram. You have to kind of go look for it. But it's also those steps in that area was the same scene that was used for the famous upside down kiss in Spider Man with Kirsten Dunst uh, there in that scene that was done there as well. So it's become a kind of an iconic be uh, area of that area of, I guess, the U Universal Studios tour. And I thought that was interesting because mm -hmm. did not know that. But man, this song was huge, huge. And Prince was on the rise and we'll be bringing him up again. Any comments on Prince? When Doves Cry? Anybody? I, I wasn't allowed because he. I was like 10 and he... He's saying about dirty things. Okay. Well, <laughs> also later in life, he was mean to me in a car dealership. So, oh, well, let's get to that story later. <laughs> when we talk about other stuff. I want to do that. It was one. a very strange interaction. 
Next, we have July 10th, the last original member of Menudo, Ricky Melendez. And if you're looking at the picture here. He is the one on the far right in the picture, the group picture there. He leaves the group and is replaced by Ricky Martin. Uh, meanwhile, Menudo reaches Asia in 1984. And there's a picture of uh, young uh, Ricky Martin there on the Oprah Winfrey show. So there you go. Look at those little wings. Look at those um, little wings. He got the little hair wings. Yep. And I thought this was cool. July 14th, Eddie Van Halen makes a special guest appearance at the concert by the Jacksons in Dallas, Texas, playing the guitar solo for Beat It Live. Dallas, that's, Texas, 1984. That's the iconic guitar, too. That's the, uh, yep. what do they call that? It looked like paint. It looked like stripes over paint, like the tape over paint. It's just the, it's the Eddie Van Halen design. That's how it is. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or as he calls the Frankenstein. It's the original Frankenstein guitar he built. Nice. And uh, in case you want to know the story too, I'll just kind of say it really quickly sure. here. He is of course part of the biggest band at the time right now, Van Halen. And they weren't, he, he kind of did this as a favor and he went uncredited and he did not get any royalties whatsoever from this. He just kind of did it as a favor to Michael because he did it underneath the radar. He didn't want to piss off anyone in his band uh, doing this because, you know, going solo and doing your own thing at this time um, wasn't a cool thing until of course, David Lee Roth eventually did it the next year. <laughs> well, it was All right. at the time. I, I, I remember like anytime someone did like a test solo thing or a test appearance somewhere, it was kind of a statement like, see, you, you guys need me. So, yeah. cause I could do this, but, but you guys need me like kind of a thing. Such an iconic solo too. Another thing I like to do during the music segment here, of course, is the top songs of 1984. And we like to pick a few at a time here, usually around eight to 10. And we start uh, right now, we're in the 40s at number 48. We have Automatic by the Pointer Sisters. 47, If Ever You're In My Arms Again by Peebo Bryson. Uh, 46, The Warrior by Scandal. Uh, 45, Hard Habit to Break by Chicago. 44, The Heart of Rock and Roll by Huey Lewis and the News. 43, Union of the Snake by Duran Duran. 42, Twist of Fate by Olivia Newton-John. 41, Drive by the Cars. And um, <laughs> Boogie Nights ruined this song for me. Number 40, Sister Christian by Night Ranger. <laughs> Uh, Lacey, uh, what are some of your favorite songs off this group? I recognize two. Uh, uh, Hard Rock and Roll, Huey, Huey Lewis, always one of my favorites. And then mm -hmm. Sister Christian, which I don't know what Boogie Nights did to it, but if you watch um, uh, Superstar, it will fix all of the problems. Because the, the, the Sister Christian, like the... <coughs> it, in Superstar with... <laughs> what's his name? Oh my God, it's so funny. It's delightful. Gotcha. Kyle, what are some of your favorites off this list? Uh, you got to go with the heart of rock and roll. I mean, come on. That's yeah. one of Huey Lewis's classic songs. It's still beaten even to this day. Uh, Sister Christian has such a weird place in music history at this point. It's, yeah. it's, it's so all over the map. And, um, you know, the warrior by scandal, that was always one that just always kind of, when you hear it, it pops right in your head and then you can't get it out for like five hours. Good call on that, Kyle. Uh, the warrior by scandal uh, is a great song, great album. And also I'm going to go with you guys, the heart of rock and roll by Huey Lewis and the news, great lyrics on that. Uh, what's so funny too, is on the hair metal podcast, <clears throat> my co-host Mike Simmer and I, we, we actually discussed, uh, bands that should have been bigger, uh, mm -hmm. in the hair metal era and, mm -hmm. and night ranger was on there. And I'm like, dude, they were huge, but he made an interesting point about that. He says he, they could have been bigger, if it wasn't for sister Christian and everyone wanting the next sister Christian, which is mm. basically a power ballad. They wanted them to re do, redo that. And they wanted to get a more rocking thing going on. And unfortunately that song kind of kept the stardom of night ranger from getting any bigger in his opinion. And I thought it was a good article. So yeah. Hmm. All right. So next 1984 guys, we got some TV to talk about. <laughs> So debuting in this month of uh, 1984 was the game show Scrabble on M uh, M NBC, and uh, we had stars uh, host Chuck Willery, Charlie Tuna, Jay Stewart, and Mark Summers. That name Mark Summers sounds familiar, Kyle. 
Uh, just a, I feel like there's a dare in there somehow. Is mm. is that the Nickelodeon show that was hosted uh, by Double, him? Da Double Dare? That's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kyle, you have some. Uh, I think you have some trivia on this, don't you? I do have some trivia on this. Give me a second here. So, um, you you hear, I'm, having a, I'm having a little internet lock right at the That's moment. That's right. I'll here. do it right here. So the trivia in okay. 1987, the show had a special week where game show hosts played against each other for home contestants who had sent in postcards. I don't remember this, but I would love to have seen it. The participants were Tom Kennedy, uh, Peter uh, Tamarkin, John Davidson, Bill Rafferty, Jamie Farr, Mark Summers, and Chuck Woolery. Uh, Summers sub-hosted when Woolery played. Uh, Chuck Woolery's return to the NBC daytime drama show 2.5 years after his departure from the Wheel of Fortune. Uh, I don't think I watched this show, but Lacey, you were a fan of it. I loved this show. This one, and then they also had um, the license plate show. I don't know. It was called like license to something. Um, and this Scrabble has always been my game. I'm a huge Scrabble nut. Uh, I do words with friends and all the different. I've got like six Scrabble apps on my phone. Um, and then the license plate game would pair with it later on where they would. Um, uh, it would like it would show you a bunch of different license plates and they would say like, you know, so when a dentist pulls into the parking lot and they'd have to like figure out what they said real quick and pick the one that would have been on, been on a this dentist. is the license plate show, not Scrabble, right? right? Yeah, okay. so they were paired together. So it was Scrabble I and see. the license plate okay. show. And that was like the hour that you didn't mess with the TV. Like everyone in my house was like I uh I used to play Scrabble at home with my mom, but she was so good at it, I yeah. got frustrated with it and I stopped playing Scrabble. I it's just, all about yeah. memorizing the two letter words that start with Q and Z. Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's, it's a little ironic we're bringing up this Chuck Woolery's return to day, NBC daytime after leaving Wheel of Fortune since Pat J. Sajak has now officially left, just left Wheel of Fortune. Mm. Ah, there you go. God, he was with that <laughs> for so long, Pat. Yeah, like uh, then, 60, 78 years, something. I don't know. Who knows? Wow. The next show we have, and I didn't know about this because I didn't have Showtime, which was, of course, uh, behind a paywall there. Uh, and uh, this is a show called Brothers. It debuted on Showtime on July 13th. And uh, it says here on the ad that we have here it was Friday at 10 p.m. Showtime. We make excitement. And uh, this was a um, this was a show, and it was kind of I think it's kind of ahead of its time here. When their youngest brother comes out as gay, two conservative men support him and help him navigate being openly gay in the 1980s Philadelphia. Created by David Lloyd and Greg uh, Antonacci, stars Robert Walden, Paul uh, Regina. Brandon Margaret, Hallie Todd, and Yeardley Smith. Kyle, uh, do you have a trivia up for you? Yeah, I got I got a few interesting pieces here. Um, after the first season, Showtime renewed it for two more seasons. This was the first time a television series got a two season renewal. Cool. This was this was his first, also the first original sitcom to air on cable television. So it wasn't Dream On. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, Dream On was the first for HBO, I assume, but uh, yeah, I but assume was, it was the first. So yeah, yeah. Um. Many of the show's early seasons contain strong adult language and themes, but the creators later toned down the material in hopes of selling the series to syndication. And Showtime planned to air the series in syndication during the second season, but the plan was received criticism from HBO, who felt that airing a pay cable show on broadcast TV would diminish subscription rates. Showtime canceled the plan, but later allowed its Gary Sandling show to air on Fox. Reruns of Brothers began airing in syndication in 1989. It is the first pay cable series to air in broadcast TV I have no memory of the show at all. Do you guys? No, but lots of firsts. I mean, that's that's a lot of firsts. I uh, I I tried to find it, uh, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I may, maybe I think I found like maybe an opening intro to the show or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I thought this was kind of a cool thing I, ahead of its time too. Took some chances. So I thought that was a good idea. So, yeah. All right, guys. Just look that, at the wardrobe. I want to take a second and just sure, yeah, just yeah. Look at the wardrobe because they they had first of all the eighties, right? Like, come on, okay. I but love it. These stereotypes in this photograph, and it's not about one of them being gay. It's about you've got the two older brothers, obviously, who are wearing like the dark suits and everything, and the younger brother who's wearing kind of like a sport coat with the the jeans. 
But the odd man out in this photo is, I'm assuming that's the dad because he's got a white beard, but he's wearing like a denim shirt and and like a suspenders pirate, that pirates baseball cap maybe no that is a philadelphia no. philly okay philadelphia. okay uh, and then suspenders yeah. and he's you know it's just because it looks like it looks like a show if you didn't have any other knowledge of this show it would look like the dad is like the working class dad who has three professionals as sons yeah kind of yeah. a thing so it does it's just this weird and the 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 wardrobe is so specifically stereotypical of that. Oh yeah, it's it is. It is uh, done on purpose, I'm sure. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I love, I love these old TV guy ads here. It says, "In the tradition of Mary Tyler Moore, Taxi and Shears, don't miss the comedy about uh, about close but very different brothers. We make excitement." So yeah, this was a mm -hmm. this was a Toledo area uh, ad uh, done in July seventh, July seventh through thirteenth, an eighty four issue of TV Guide. So there you go. I, I just want to throw out this show had 115 episodes. Wow. No that's idea. Crazy. Wow. In, in 1984, yeah. that's, I mean, this is, this is before, you know, this is before it was safe to come out. This is before the AIDS, well, the very, very beginning of the AIDS crisis. This is like, this is a, a big deal for, yeah. for a show. And I mean, this would never have been released on, on like regular, like network television at the time. So, I mean, I guess 1989 is when you said it was syndicated. That's yeah. a that's a big that's a big leap for for a, a, a network to do. Kudos yeah. to Showtime. That's awesome. All right, guys. I'm wearing a shirt right now. It says Santa Barbara <laughs> on it. In the logo of one of my favorite soap operas, my only favorite soap opera of all time, Santa Barbara. And uh I need a, I need a minute here, guys, because I want to share something with you. Here we go. <laughs> Robin Wright is Kelly Perkins. Yeah. Marcy Walker is Eden Capwell. Yep. And A. Martinez as Cruz Castillo. All right, guys, this show meant a big deal to me growing up. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, I, I don't know if you guys remember it. Uh, let me just start there first. Uh, yes or no, do you remember the show, Kyle? I, I remember, I, I seem to remember one of the biggest things that happened with it was either, was two, there's two, there was, I believe there was a huge earthquake episode, and I believe there was like a huge fire episode of Santa Barbara, if I'm remembering correctly. You would be correct there. Uh, Lacey, do you remember Santa Barbara? I do remember Santa Barbara. I remember that along with a couple of others that we would watch every day because my grandmother had, uh, she's a beautician and she had her, her shop in the house. So in the parlor. And so she would rinse and curl and wash and set. And then the ladies would sit in the little, those little machines, you know, the, the dryers. And she'd come in like every 20 minutes and sit and say, okay, what happened? And then, and, you know, smoke her <laughs> cigarette and then she'd go back to, you know, blow out and do all the thing. And then it well, happened again. Okay. What happened? <laughs> well, I had no interest in watching any soap operas, uh, even the primetime soap operas. I just, I had no interest in it. And my parents didn't either. However, something happened on a, a, a day in uh, Santa Barbara where I'm living now is where I grew up. And just down a couple blocks is the beach and a very beautiful drive that goes down there. And we witnessed some filming that was going on. We saw a uh, we saw a bus with a big window blown out of it and actors around there and uh, found out that it was one of the opening scenes of the first episode where Joe Perkins, who was uh, wrongfully accused of killing one of the Capwell brothers, comes back to reunite with his long lost love. And of course, that is uh, Kelly Capwell. As we now know, Kelly, <laughs> first of all, here's uh, some uh, people that we've seen from her. But there's Robin Wright, young Kelly Capwell. And that's Joe Perkins up there on the right, if you're looking at the video here. Uh, yeah, we saw this being filmed. And my mom and I were like, we got to check out this show. It's about Santa Barbara. And uh, even though it was filmed in mostly in uh, closed studios down in Santa, Santa, Santa Clarita, uh, outside of L.A., they did do some filming locations. And uh they use the opening, uh, uh, you know, montage. They save different 
the opening had a lot of Santa Barbara locations and everything. There was a lot of mentioning of Santa Barbara streets, um, but we didn't have uh, a, a Chinatown, <laughs> as they mentioned. There's a lot of things that Santa Barbara didn't have, and the murder rate was really high, apparently, on this show in Santa Barbara. <laughs> but I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and basically, it's Santa Barbara, California. The fascinating lives of the wealthy Capwells revolves around the Lockridge, the rival family, and other more modest families such as the Andretis and Perkins, whose fate now is the same. Everyone gets tormented by. And it was uh, created by the Dobsons, Bridget and Jerome, uh, starring uh, A. Martinez and Marcy Walker. They became the kings and queens of the show. They were the power couple. Of course, you know. Every, uh, every, um, there they are right there. And when they had their wedding, it was one of the biggest things in the world, of course, at the time. And I found out too, guys, that there was a huge popularity in Europe of this show, specifically in Germany and in Russia. Uh, they got a lot of late reruns and stuff like that. But I watched this, rec we would, what we would do is we recorded on our VCR and wait till I got home and then we would watch it after I watched some of my cartoons. And sometimes my dad would check in, but he wasn't really there for it. It was just me and my mom uh, and absolutely love this show. And what's funny too, and I'm going to get the trivia on this one, if you don't mind, Kyle, because uh, yeah, this is really coming from uh, a Martinez refused the role of Cruz Castillo three times because he despised the soap opera genre. He appeared in 1,493 episodes, 270 more than his on-screen uh, wife, Marcy Walker. She had a little over 1,200. And uh, when the characters of Cruz and Eden were expecting a child, an audience poll was conducted to see what name they would like the children to be given. Two boys' names and two girls' names were given. In the end, they had a girl, and her name was Adriana. Now, this is where I kind of laugh because this was one of the most frustrating things about watching this show during the summertime, Lacey, and you brought it up earlier. The show was preempted a total of 73 times for either holidays, sporting events, award shows, presidential inaugurations or for special reports that weren't planned in advance. 81, 84 had one, 85 had eight, 86 had seven. And it was just infuriating. And the, this is why I hate watching Wimbledon because Wimbledon always preempted it because it was on NBC, just like this show was. Although yep. I love the Wimbledon movie, <laughs> Yay! but yeah. Uh, and you know, there were some great character actors on here and, uh, uh, just one of one of my guiltiest pleasures of all time. Yes, Lacey. Okay, two things. First of all, like soap opera actors are a different, just a different breed of actor. They are their memories, like their the capability that they have with memor like memorizing lines, is insane. Like you watch some of this stuff and you realize they have a day to shoot, whereas every like every other TV show has has a week to shoot like they're 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 five episodes a day i mean five episodes a yeah. week and a tv show regular standards one episode so they're they're filming five times the amount and everybody yeah. always talks about like all the film actors always talk about how having a tv actor on is like great because they they're just so fast and you know at it and everything but what it comes down to is when a soap actor guests on a tv show like they're just in it done and everybody's like what just happened? So <laughs> so fast and so amazing your memories. Yeah. If you're looking at this picture here, you see the big picture of, of Cruz and uh, um, Cruz and Eden. Mm -hmm. But down on the bottom right was my favorite couple. And uh, that was played by uh, uh, there's Julia played by um, Nancy Lee Graham. And then you had uh, what's his name? Lane Davies as Mason. I had such a huge crush on La Nancy Lee Graham. Uh, her character, Julia, I actually named one of my guitars after her. Nice. <laughs> So you said but, something about the, the, the murder rate. Do you think the murder rate is higher on Santa Barbara or on Psych? I think it's Psych now. <laughs> so, yeah, funny you say that because Psych takes place in Santa Barbara, mm -hmm, but filmed mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Uh, but uh, the biggest star that uh, ended up leaving and becoming uh, even a bigger star, of course, is Robin Wright. Of course, most people know her as the Princess Bride, but also she was one of the warrior Amazonian uh, kick-ass characters in the uh, Wonder Woman film starring Gal Gadot. So uh, she's doing quite well. She also uh, did a, a great job run on House of Cards as well. But uh, uh, yeah, so thank you guys for letting me go on with this because, uh, you know, it's Santa Barbara. I love it. So <laughs> and every now and then I'll go on YouTube and watch an old episode. I'm like, <laughs> talk about fashion, Lacey. Oh, my God. There was some oh crimes goodness. done there. So not a shoulder pad left unturned. Yes. Not a banana uh, clip, not a banana. Like, like literally 
the 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 video you just showed it was like robin wright as you know yeah character name and then the next picture i don't even know what the person's name was it was just banana clip like <laughs> yeah. i just saw the the big giant banana clip hair yeah oh my goodness so next we have some shows that were ending and we mentioned jim carrey's show the duck factory which did not last long at all a few episodes ago that landed but also uh real people ended uh started ended in july 4th 19 it started in 1979 but ended july 4th of 84 mm -hmm. this is a great show we've talked about it earlier the pre the prehistoric ancestor to america's funniest home videos and of course had host sarah Purcell, skip stevenson john barber and byron allen who is probably the most successful person right now because apparently this guy is a billionaire brian allen uh, from the stuff that he's gotten into in the businesses. Uh, Kyle, were you a fan of Real People? I remember, I think at the time when that show was coming out, Sarah Purcell was probably the big deal on that show. Yeah, yep. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Lacey, you remember Real People? I, I vaguely remember it, but I can't remember. I don't know if I remember it because we talked about it or if we were, I remember it because I saw it. Like, it's that it's that little amount. Um, it was a big, it was a big deal. You know, it, it, it was uh, highlighting people and yeah, some of them were funny stuff, but some of them were real and dramatic as well. Okay. And so, but I don't because yeah, it, it, it celebrated normal people doing interesting things, which I thought okay. was really cool. So some of them were stupid, you know, but some of them were heartwarming too. It was nice. So uh, we also had ending this year, July, uh, of uh, July 27th, the Hollywood squares slash match game hour. I huge fan of Hollywood squares. It did return in 1986 because it's fascinating. And you'll see in this picture, we had a young Arsenio hall as a guest. And then of course you had like, you know, Paul Lynch and Vincent price and rich little, uh, a lot of famous people like lived in these squares. You'd see them all the time. And they like, like, I think Paul Lynn, Paul Lynn was like there all the time. And he was very funny and it was just a great way for, uh, to, to see these people cut it up with the, uh, the regular people playing them as, 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 you know, you know, X's and O's, uh, Kyle, your thoughts on uh, Hollywood squares. Hollywood squares was great. And Hollywood squares might be the most canceled and returned game show of all time. In fact, <laughs> it is coming back yet again. Drew Barrymore's production company is, is coming back, is bringing it back. Of course, with I Drew didn't Barrymore know that as, a, as the center square. So with who? That is the center square. Drew Barrymore. Oh, Drew's going to be the middle? Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love that, Kyle. I did not know that. It's it's hard, though, because the original, there were, I mean, legally, like, television standards and practices, they kind of let game shows kind of do their thing. They didn't, I mean, it wasn't like a scripted show where they had specific rules and they could, you know, whatever. And so standards and practices didn't seem to care about the um, the sheer amount of innuendo on game shows. Oh television. my God. Yes. <laughs> I mean, think about like the match game or the, the newlywed game or whatever. And the Hollywood squares was no different. You had, you know, people were talking, I mean, there were like comments about that. It was like sex or, Paul Lynn was or race famous or for all that. kinds of things. Yeah. And so when it came back, what did you say in the late 80s, right? Um, yeah. 89, 90, somewhere in there. I remember it didn't do very well because the, that standard and practices had kind of started going, hey, guys, no, wait, wait, wait we got to yeah. check out what you're doing. Yeah, it's, uh, so and now, I know it, it returned, I think, like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah. Ago. I mean, there's always some new incarnations of it. And uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's a great concept. Mm -hmm. uh, to get uh, celebrities uh, battling out these 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 questions and stuff, it's just it it, it was yeah. a lot of fun. So. I remember Buddy Hackett was always on it, and he always like there was a lot yeah. of like he he did not. I don't think he was um, had a. I don't think he was an ist of any sort. I don't think he, yeah. <laughs> he was racist or sexist or whatever. I just think that because he was a comedian, he just sort of everyone was up for. Oh yeah, and yeah. It, 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 it kind of became a roast as well. So yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm doing this just for you because there's a Raiders connection to Hollywood Squares. In the 1980s, John Matuzak was one of the regulars on Hollywood Squares. Nice. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I have to look into those videos. That's cool. Well, we also like to talk television when it comes to highest rated stuff, guys, here. And I have never seen an episode of this. And uh, rated number 11 uh, out of the top 30, 32 in 1984 was Crazy Like a Fox. 
uh, starring uh, Jack Warden, uh, John Rubenstein, and Penny Pizer. Uh, rough and tumble private investigator Harry Fox Sr. solves crimes with his reluctant help of his son, uh, respected San Francisco lawyer Harrison Fox Jr. I didn't watch this show. Did you guys? I remember this. I remember it, but I never, I never watched yeah. it. Yeah. I remember seeing ads for it. Yeah. No, I, then, I think we definitely watched it. I don't know how long it. You said it was only one season. Oh, uh, I no, no, no. I don't know. Cool. It's just, it okay. says actually it says up here. Uh, was it list here? It says eighty four to eighty six. So technically, that's two seasons. But it, yeah, it was it, like... it it was rated number eleven uh, this year. So it was popular yeah. for a hot while. So yeah, I feel like I definitely watched this. You know, maybe mm -hmm. at the grandparents' house or something over the summer. Yeah. Well, next we had uh, in our top rated ones here is of course Hotel, <laughs> five seasons, hundred and fourteen episodes. According to the DVD uh, uh, there, if you want to buy the, the set. Of course, that starred James Brolin, Connie Selica, Nathan Cook, and Sherry Belafonte. We've touched on this before. Still popular. This ran from 83 to 88. So this is just uh, the second year, and it's doing quite well. Um, I'm not sure, I don't remember which night that it was. Do you guys remember what night Hotel dropped on? I, I, I don't remember what night it was. I just remember Connie Selica. I just remember that James Brolin's beard should have had its own nameplate. Like it, like it's just very <laughs> like there. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we're going to turn the page here. This is the fandom podcast network. And we are now discussing the movies of 1984. First, we're going to start off with some uh, moving news. July 1st, the Motion Picture Association of Calif or of, of America institutes the PG-13 rating as a response to violent horror films such as Gremlins and Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. I seem to remember, uh, I think one of the first ones was Red Dawn, which we'll be touching on in a future show. Uh, this is a big deal. I, I felt like as a teenager, because I was 13 going into 84 here, I uh, turned 14 in September, but I was just like, oh, this is cool that I get to see these kind of like not quite our films by myself. Kyle, was this a big deal in uh, Alaska? It, it was because and the big deal was it was Gremlins and Temple of Doom. It was the, the, both of those movies pushed the envelope so much and that they, they were rated PG and I can remember, especially when I went and saw Gremlins, there were as many a parent who took their children out of that movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lacey, yeah. do you remember the PG-13? You were still under there, but you know. Yeah, I was still under, but I think that, I think it was uh, Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, and then, um, like you said, uh, Red Dawn. I think one of them was filmed first, and the other one was released first, so they both have the moniker of being the first PG-13 movie. Because gotcha. one of them was filmed first and one of them was released first. Um, I don't remember Gremlins. I think Gremlins had a PG rating. As a matter of fact, I, I'm like 99%. Yeah. It was sure. because of Gremlins, but, Indiana Jones, and Double Doom. They're like, yeah, yeah. we got to do this PG-13 thing going on. So Yeah. And um, nowadays, PG-13 means you can say the F word once. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, so, oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> July 27th, and we'll get uh, we'll talk more about this more uh, coming up. Prince's first film, Purple Rain, is released. <laughs> but we also like to uh, touch on some of the uh, film uh, celebrity film debuts in 84, and we had a few here. Uh, we had, of course, Andy McDowell and Grey Stoke, The Legend of Tarzan. We had Kyle McLaughlin in Dune, Tress McNeil in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and Francis McDormand in Blood Simple. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into the films that we're talking here. But first, I think I need to make a call here. Hold on. We Star Lee. You have been recruited by Star Lee to defend the frontier against Tour. Centauri, <laughs> <Is it> hello? <laughs> hey, Lacey, you're, you're on live now with uh, Time Warp. What movie should we talk about next? Ooh, ooh, last Starfighter, last Starfighter. Last Starfighter it is. And that was me calling Lacey live during the show because, Lacey, your ringtone is the last Starfighter. 
It is. And this is me now silencing my phone because I've been like terrified over the last hour that my phone was going to ring in the middle of our podcast. So I'm turning last, my wings off now. <laughs> last Starfighter released July 13th, 1984, uh, made about $22 million uh, in its first theatrical run. And the main poster says Alex Rogan was a small town boy with big time dreams. But in his wildest dreams, he never suspected that tonight he would become the last Starfighter. Directed by Nick Castle, of course, starring Lance Guest, Robert Preston, K.E. Cutter, Catherine Mary Stewart, Dan O'Hearley, Chris Herbert, and Barbara Bonson. Kyle, I know you've got us some trivia. Yes, I do. The star car that Centauri drives is based on a DeLorean, including its gold wing doors and its stainless steel construction. According to screenwriter Jonathan R. Butel, the idea for the movie came about because he wandered into a video arcade and saw a young boy playing a video game. At that time, he was reading the book about King Arthur, the once and future king by T.H. White. He wondered what would happen if a video game were a metaphor metaphorical sword in a stone and a boy ranked up an incredible score, which would cause a ripple effect across the universe. During the movie, when Centauri gets into trouble for using the game to recruit star fighters, it is referred to as the Excalibur test. Excalibur, of course, was the sword that King Arthur possessed. Um, a great number of the scenes with the beta unit were shot after main filming was complete because the test audience liked the comic relief of the beta unit scenes. And director Nick Castle decided they added more originality to the boy gets to go to outer space story. This is why in many of the beta unit scenes, Lance Guest is wearing a wig. He had cut his hair by the time those new scenes were shot. Um, Will Wheaton's speaking scenes were deleted, but he is visible in two scenes early in the movie. He runs around the trailer park early in a red football jersey. In the final scene, he is obscured wearing a blue jacket, possibly over the red jersey, standing behind Lewis Rogan. All right, let's give our thoughts here on The Last Starfighter. Lacey, let's start with you. This is one of my, obviously, <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Um, I I think we did The the Last Starfighter, the, the full podcast on it. Um, so uh, it's just, it's been, or at least I did, I don't know. All my podcasts get get confused, um, but uh, it, it's just it's absolutely fantastic. It's it's one of those ones where no matter what I'm doing or if I'm in a bad mood, it always you know brings me up. And it's just it's there's just enough humor and just enough um, positivity. There's not a lot of language. It's it's a good like wholesome movie um you know it's about a kid who's you know 18 years old or 19 years old he's got to make some decisions like this is there's a lot of things you know about family and there's about you know leaving family or leaving home or you know what are you going to do with your life kind of decisions which i think are it's very um relatable to literally anyone even if you're not into science fiction and it's got if you get the blu-ray it's got three different commentaries it's got the original one it's got one with Lance Guest and his son, who is now 20, that they recorded during the pandemic. So there are actually like historical statements, like just like history is represented within that commentary based on the fact that they talk about how they're having to do it from home and they're they're in like, you know, in the house and talking about the pandemic and stuff like that. And uh, it, it's a really, it's one of my favorites. It's, yeah. Kyle. The Last Starfighter is one of the biggest cult following films to come out of the 80s it is a classic sci-fi story playing up on the idea of how many of us played whether we we're in the video arcade or at home on our whatever home video game system we had that was us saving the universe in the actual game because we got so lost in the game and this plays up on this so amazingly it is such a great film and surprisingly enough the computer effects hold up very well to this day I mean, you had this and Tron coming out about around the same same time frame. Um, the Gunstar is still one of my favorite all time designs in um, sci fi science fiction history. Um, Lance Guest, I, I think this. that's universal with all sci fi fans. It is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, what what is amazing to me too is through all of this time, and I know there's been a lot of talk of making some kind of sequel, but that the fact that they never really have franchised this or made a sequel out of this, I think is actually what makes this movie even more magical. Yeah, good points. Apologize for cutting you on there, but the Gunstar dude, 
I've seen a lot of people uh, do custom jobs on this ship and it, it didn't get the toy release because of the disappointment of the film. There's been, uh, you, you can see some, some cool like uh, mock-ups that they had plans for, but this is something they need to revisit. I know there've been works of a sequel uh, and Lance guest, uh, I know is game for it as well. And I, I think it would be, it would be nice to see, you know, his son, you know, get in on this and kind of see what happened with, with this world. But and I want to ask you this question, Kyle, and Lacey, feel free to chime in here. We are talking about, we've talked about the perfect movies. Could, is this movie, could this fall under perfect movies? Like, yes. you know, movies, movies like, you know, Galaxy Quest and Princess Bride. Yes. I'm, I'm going to say it's, well, I'm going to say it's close. I think the aspect of, there's aspects of this movie that are dated. And I think that is one of the things about a perfect film is that, it feels timeless and, and and last fighter starfighter is like right there but there are some aspects of this film that are a little bit dated yeah I, but I, but i think but i'm gonna say i will say this though it is a movie that i would if somebody tells me they haven't seen it and they're they tell me they're a science fiction fan or getting interested in science fiction it's a movie i'm going to show them to, as a as a gateway into that world without a question great suggestion and uh i had a a really unique experience uh, there is a convention in Atlanta called the Kentucky Fried Gaming Convention. I, I I believe that's the full name of it. I don't know if it still exists, but back in 2017, I went to it because Lance Guest was there as the featured, uh, well, guest. And this convention was really cool because it, it showcases video games. It showcases pinballs. And it brings in all these old style arcades and pinballs. You get to play them for free. One of my favorite rooms was the history of home consoles way back to the early Pong. And even before that, the uh, tennis for two all the way up until the new Xboxes and PlayStation fours. And I got a chance to meet uh, Lance because uh, I wanted to get something signed for Norm. Cause as you know, our fellow founder of the, the podcast network, fan of podcast network, Norman, Norman Lau, um, uh, he is a huge uh, fan and I got uh, some stuff signed for him. But what's funny too is I got like a DVD sign and I was in the dealer room and I found that one of the dealers had a last Starfighter laser disc and I bought it and went over to have Lance sign it. I got a picture uh, of with him uh, in this picture here. Very sweet guy. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that we do get to see more of the last Starfighter. I would love to see that. So yeah. Oh, by the way, I took pictures of the mock-up of the last Starfighter video game that they had there. You could actually play it because they never released one officially. Yeah, it's a crime. It's a crime, yes. Kevin. Sorry to interrupt, but, but that is a crime. No, good time to interrupt <laughs> because it is a crime. And other people have recreated this. Uh, the one in the middle there and the one on the left is the one that I played. And then the one on the right was another version that was homemade. And I tried to play this and I sucked ass and I will not be the last Starfighter. <laughs> It was hard. It was really hard. All right, guys. The next film that we have is The Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, officially the third film of the original Muppets trilogy until they started uh, coming out with other great films with The Muppets. Made a little over $25 million in its initial release. Uh, Kermit and his friends go to New York City to get their musical on Broadway, only to find it's more a difficult task than anticipated. The Muppets Muppets graduate from college and decide to uh, take their senior review on the road. And just to kind of sum up with this, I hadn't seen this movie in over 30 years. It was because I seem to remember at the time, this was my least favorite of the, of a lot of the Muppet movies. And um, uh, it's directed by Frank Oz, of course, and stars Jim Henson, Frank Oz, Dave Goles, Art Carney, Dabney Coleman, Gregory Hines, Linda Lavin, jo Joan Rivers, Elliot Gould, Liza Minnelli, Brooke Shields, just to name a few. They do a great job of getting all of the, uh, you know, really, really popular stars at the time and legendary actors and actresses and singers and, and entertainers. Uh, just, just as a reminder, this is the one where, um, uh, you know, Kermit the Frog and Piggy get married at the end, but also uh, Kermit loses his memory and there's some funny shenanigans that goes on. Um, it's not my favorite. It's one of my least favorites. Uh, I think the Muppet Caper and of course the, the Christmas Carol are my personal favorites. Love the Muppet Caper. Uh, the weird guy, Lou something with the big bug eyes who um, uh, uh, juggles fish. fish. What's his name? The fish. Oh, I was just saying the fish. His name is Lou something, but he has the funniest line. Uh, he has these real one-liners. I remember in the Muppet Caper, he's like, I brought the paper towels when they're getting ready to like break into the uh, uh, the uh, museum. Just love that guy. 
Uh, Lacey, your thoughts on Muppets Take Manhattan? I love all the Muppets movies. I I, I do. There is a. I wish I had remembered prior to this. I actually have two, like three foot paintings that I had a friend of mine do of one of Statler and one of Waldorf. And in my nice. movie room, they are sitting above the, the fireplace so that they are off to the side. And I have a little banister that I had made for them. So it looks like they're in their balcony judging me while I watch my movies. I love that. that I, is, love I, I remember si Kyle and I saw that. We're like, this is a perfect place for them. Like the, the, the Muppets are my happy place. Like anytime yeah. there's just stress or whatever, you can always jump in and watch the Muppets and just, oh, I love the Muppets. They're amazing. Kyle, before you give your opinion on this, I know you've got some trivia and I noticed that there's a first appearance of something in this movie as well. Yeah, there is. Um, and I'm going to get to that, but this first piece of trivia tell, tells me all you need to know about the magic of Jim Henson and the Muppets. Um, in an interview, Juliana Donald, who played Jenny, recalled how filming of the jogging scene in the park was temporarily delayed by a camera problem. In wide-eyed amazement, a little boy passing by approached and started talking to Kermit, oblivious to Jim Henson operating him. Despite the surrounding commotion of technicians trying to fix the camera issue, Jim started interacting with the boy. Moments later, Jim found himself doing an impromptu performance with Kermit for an entire group of children who had gathered around to watch. Juliana said, it was so memorable to me because time just stopped. It was a wonderfully magical moment where you experience someone's true joy with their work. This I mean, was that, during the this was during the bike riding scene, which was pretty impressive, if I remember correctly, right? The jogging. Jogging? The jogging scene. The bike riding okay, the scene thinking of his great, great Muppet caper. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Um, it also is the first appearance of the Muppet Babies, who went on to have a very long-lasting cartoon, which premiered two months after this film's release. Can you say tie-in marketing, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. <laughs> you leave um, the Muppet Babies alone. <laughs> I got a couple other quick ones real quick. The portrait of Kermit in his producer's disguise has become a permanent fixture at the real Sardis and can be seen in other movies set there. I love that. That's so great. And after several less than satisfying takes of the scene, Joan Rivers and Miss Piggy director performer Frank Oz sent a stage hand to get him and Rivers two gin and tonics apiece. The two chatted and imbibed in bib. Yeah, the two cha chatted and had their drinks before filming one more take, which appears in the final film. So they had to get him a little drunk. <laughs> yeah. So, so I. My my feeling on Muppets Take Manhattan, if you look at the original trilogy of Muppet films, the Muppet movie, Great Muppet Caper, and Muppets Take Manhattan, it's my least favorite of the three. And I think when I, when I go back and think about the reasons for that, is I think there was times where they were playing, trying to play up a little bit too uh, much on the highbrow New York thing that was going on in that, especially in that time, time right. frame. And the whole Kermit getting amnesia thing was just kind of a little, uh, and that, that, just, that brings it down, yeah. Yeah, it just didn't have the wacky fun that the original Muppet movie and Great Muppet Caper had, which they recaptured when you talk about Muppet Christmas Carol or Muppet Treasure Island. It just it just felt like it was missing that like that wacky level of the Muppets that you would that you would normally get. It, it felt like they were trying to adult it up just a tad. And no, mm -hmm. I, I need my Muppets to be fun. I need them to be wacky, and I just need them to be in, insane. And so, yeah. I'm with you, Kevin. This is probably my least favorite of the Muppet films. So out of all the Muppet movies, what are you guys' favorites? Christmas Carol. M Muppet's Christmas Carol is up there. Great Muppet Caper is up there, too. And I'm I'm still a fan of the original Muppet movie. It's, that movie's magic. When it comes to the trilogy, uh, Lacey, the second one's my favorite. Because um, I, 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 knowing I was going to watch this, I had to watch the first two to kind of just get in the mode and have a comparison between these. And yeah, and uh, the Muppet caper is still my favorite, you know, because at the time I didn't know this. And if you watch that, uh, it's currently on um, Disney plus, if you watch the documentary about um, Frank Oz, uh, the Muppet show was brought to England. Uh, a, a famous producer or whatever says, let's bring the Muppets, but you got to bring it to England. So the whole Muppet show TV series is filmed in England. And uh, that's why the Muppet Caper was also filmed there as well. And a lot of the stuff that you see was probably filmed there because they had, of course, these, uh, these city uh, streets that, you know, they had sets and stuff. But they did film, of course, some scenes uh, in and around New York, though. But uh, 
um, yeah, I, you know, give me, I'll take any Muppet movie any day. I still need to go watch though Muppets from space because that was the one about Gonzo. Uh, and I do remember liking that. But that now that I've seen the Muppets take Manhattan, that's the one I remember least. And I don't think I've seen the Wizard of Oz one, even though I own it, I haven't watched it yet. The Muppets from Space has the Dawson's Creek kids in it. Okay. <laughs> like, it's so funny when you talk about the different, you know, the different eras, you know, because the, the old school ones have these, you know, like just stellar cameos, you know, and then it's interesting to see, like, you can really track pop culture by knowing what, which cameos are in, in each of the films. I just want to reply to that saying you're absolutely right. Great point because I had watched the original Muppet show and I did a post how amazing the cameo appearances from that legends. I don't know how I, I I'm guessing that, you know, the reputation that Jim Henson had through Sesame mm -hmm. street and all that, when he called out to famous people, they were like, yeah, I'm coming. And they probably worked for scale, maybe for free. I got to assume that whatever star power he had was just in the list. So yeah. Well, well people, there's, there's been a ton of people interviewed talking about how it was a lot of these stars did a lot of things that their kids couldn't watch. And so yeah. they would call and say, Hey, can I get on Sesame street? Can I get on the Muppets? They would, they, they didn't have to ask people anymore. Like after the That's first season or second season, they, they, they had such an influx of people wanting to be on the show. That's that. that yeah. That's a good point. They touch on that on that documentary. Uh, oh, really? sure you guys, ch yeah, check that out. It's on cool. Disney Plus. It's it's a I, I'm forgetting the name of it, um, but it is it is excellent. Cool. All right, guys. The next film we have is an interesting one, uh, and it it, uh, it it definitely was on my radar because I hadn't heard of this film at all. I don't remember this film. I don't remember it in syndication. This is called Best Defense. Came out July twentieth. Uh, made about almost $20 million uh, stars Dudley Moore with strategic guest star, Eddie Murphy. And uh, the poster says, unfortunately they're both on our side, best defense a military. Uh, it's about a military weapons engineer who struggles to do his job responsibly while a hapless tank commander has to live with the consequences of his tank designs. Uh, a few years later in combat uh, directed by Willard um, Hayek, uh, stars Dudley Moore, Eddie Murphy, Kate Capshaw, and George DeZunza. Uh, before I get into my thoughts here, Kyle, uh, I want you to start the trivia because I'm going to expand on a couple of these. So go for it. Okay. So, um, yeah. This, first of all, I just want to say I agree with you, Kevin. This is this is a very bizarre movie for many reasons. Um, in the trivia, Eddie Murphy's character was added to the film after the original version tested poorly with audiences. Um, when Eddie Murphy hosted Saturday Night Live, he mocked the film and his decision to appear in it by saying, what? How dare you give me a script like this? Oh, that much money? Let's go. Murphy had, has also said, how did I get involved? The door opened and four men came in carrying a check. Um, though Eddie Murphy is listed as strategic guest star, he claimed in an interview with David Letterman that he was paid more for his work in this film than for 48 hours and trading places combined. A um, little bit of interesting in this film, Iraq invades Kuwait six years later. It actually happened. And all of Eddie Murphy's scenes in the XM-10 Annihilator tank were shot in Israel, except for one scene shot in California in which the character meets Dudley Moore's character on a military base. The scene was deleted from the final cut, but a still from the scene was used in a promotional materials and movie theater lobby cards. Okay, so I recently watched this, and I did a special post about this. Uh Eddie Murphy was added to this film. Okay, so this film was actually completed in 1982 and tested horribly. Uh, 83, of course, 82, 83, Eddie Murphy's uh, star is on the rise here. And they filmed his scenes added to this film in 83. Uh, and I found out that he was paid $1 million for his scenes in this. And it's not a lot. Uh, there is some moments in this, though. The movie opens up with Eddie Murphy having a sex scene uh, over there in uh, what it was supposed to be Kuwait. So you think it's like, oh, we're going to get a good Eddie Murphy film here. But he's not in it a lot. And also, Eddie Murphy and uh, uh, Dudley Moore do not share a scene in this film. And apparently, depending on the trivia that you want to believe, Jeffrey Katzenberg himself was one of the guys that dropped off that $1 million check to uh, Eddie Murphy in this thing. I was very curious about this film. Uh, I'm, I have the DVD right here. Uh, and it's you, if you look at it from a distance, you can't tell it's Eddie Murphy until you get a little bit close to it there, including the poster. 
Um, and uh, I got to tell you, <laughs> this movie's a tough watch. I Part of it's because, and I know you disagree with this, Lacey. Lacey I'm not a big Dudley Moore guy. And, uh, you know, I, I was trying to look at the other characters. George DeZunza, who's a great character actor, he plays his co-worker. He's entertaining. Uh, Kate Capshaw uh, plays kind of like, you know, the, the woman that's falling, his wife that's falling out of love with him, uh, kind of more of a wet blanket character. And uh, and then you see Dudley Moore flirt, flirting with one of his uh, co-workers who is uh, getting turned on by his sudden success in this. The weirdest thing about this film is to make these Eddie Murphy scenes fit. You're going back in time between like 82 and 84 because the 84 scenes is when supposedly the invasion of Kuwait happens uh, from Iraq and you see Eddie Murphy in his scenes while the stuff in 82 is when he's designing this stuff with the tank that's going wrong in 84. Really, really weird, weird film. Didn't like it. Uh, and, but I see why it actually made money because of Eddie Murphy. Lacey, your thoughts on best defense. It's, I mean, the movie itself is just so uh, y'all <laughs> it's not, it's not great. Um, I love, I absolutely love Dudley Moore. Um, this is a, an altogether not very memorable film. Um, but it's just funny. Like if you actually sit down to watch it, it's got some funny parts that are, well, they're definitely dated because there's, I don't know how recently you watched it, but this I watched be, it recently. This can probably be made today. There's a little bit of conversation anyway. Um, but uh, you know, I think that pulling Eddie Murphy into it was a, a str strategic move. Um, uh, and I think that it worked. I don't think that today it would have been made at all. So, um, you know, it, on the list of of Dudley Moore movies, it's not necessarily up towards the top with, you know, Arthur or, yeah, you know, um, Bedazzled it, or something like that. Yeah. But it does prove the point that test audiences matter. And they, I, I've been part of one test audience in my life, and that was the original version of um, 12 Monkeys with Brad Pitt and um, uh, uh, Willis. Willis. So it's, yeah. your, it's your fault, is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. It's anyway. your fault that I just, that movie just was like, <laughs> the first, first part of it wasn't good. So trust me, <laughs> Kyle. So, 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 so here's the thing with this movie, and this is something that we really need to step back and go, how impressive this is. How immensely popular and how bright Eddie Murphy's star was at this point. Mm -hmm. or, because otherwise, this movie never gets put out. If no. Eddie Murphy doesn't agree to do what he did, because there is nobody else in Hollywood at that time that they could have put in that role to make that even work remotely well. And I don't think there's anybody in Hollywood right now that you could even do that with to put it in and get to save a film like this. This is a probably one of the few times ever in Hollywood that something like this has happened where they put in somebody after the fact to, to literally save a movie. And Keanu, Reeves. Yeah. Keanu Reeves can be dropped into any movie and rescue it. That's just a fact. <laughs> Keanu Reeves can rescue yep. any movie. I'm pretty sure Brendan Fraser can as well. Yeah. They're just, yeah. they're the internet's boyfriend, man. Everybody yeah. on the internet's going to go see that movie. It's, those two men can save a movie. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, that is a good debate, but it, it is an interesting thing in, in movie history. And there's probably a lot of stuff, too, that we've seen and, and liked because reshoots were done and people were put in. Kyle, did you ever end up seeing this film? I, I, I haven't seen it in a good while, but I did end up seeing it. Um, you know, it was it was Eddie Murphy, and especially in the 80s and the, and the 90s. There's a point where everybody, like, I got to see everything Eddie Murphy did at that time. Because yeah. it's just so, he is so amazing. And it's like, okay, what just happened here? <laughs> <laughs> the next film we're going to discuss is the Bostonians. Uh, this uh, made only $312,000 in the theater. Uh, and the, the, um, the poster says a rare delight, a high comedy with tragic undertones acted to passionate perfection, a major achievement. According to Vincent Cranby of the New York times, a Bostonian starring Christopher Reeve, Vanessa Redgrave and Jessica Jessica Tandy, a Boston feminist and a conservative Southern lawyer contend for the heart and mind of a beautiful and bright girl unsure of her future. I believe this takes place. This is on Tubi. You can watch this on Tubi. Uh, I believe it takes place around 1870, something like that. 
Uh, and um, I have a rule when it comes to watching films and applying them to my letterbox collection, guys. This is just a house rule. This is a Kevin house rule that I need to mention that I have to at least watch about 40 to 45 minutes of a film before I start to check out of it. If I do reach that or at least half a film to count to go on to my letterbox collection. Oh my God, did I struggle getting to the halfway point or at least 40 minutes of this freaking film, okay? But I did, but I checked out about 15 minutes into it and I just kind of let it play while I was writing show notes for another podcast, guys. Uh, and um, I'm going to go into my reason why, but first, Kyle, do you have a little bit of trivia on this? Please don't waste a lot of time on this, though. <laughs> okay, trivia, 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 trivia. I have a little bit. Um, Christopher Reed said of his of this film in his autobiography, Still Me, in 1998, producer Ismael uh, Merchant could only afford to pay me $100,000, less, less than a tenth of my established price at the time. I insisted that the money was not an issue, but this was the kind of work I ought to be doing. But my agent told me, if you do the picture with those wandering minstrels, it will be one foot in the grave of your career. I cheerfully ignored the advice. Um, maybe you shouldn't listen, Christopher. Just, just, just say. Okay. I, I don't even borrow the rest of the trivia on this one. Okay. Yeah. I really tried this one because I wanted to see Christopher Reeves in a different role here. And I know he's trying to break out of the Superman thing. We get it. I get you. And I'm like, why is this movie? Basically, it's a bunch of really fancy costumes with stuffy people with stuffy problems that are rich. Okay. And the Gilded Age is doing a much better job of it right now on HBO. I looked up the director, James Ivory, and I realized why I was falling asleep during this film. He did the movies Remains of the Day, A Room with a View, and Howard's End. Three movies that I avoided at all costs, especially Remains of the Day and Howard's End, because they were giving so much unnecessary, stuffy attention during the Oscars. Not a fan at all. Um, this movie sucked. Just sucked. Anyway, that's my opinion. Uh, Lacey, have you seen the Bostonians? I have. I vaguely remember it. Um, I love Merchant Ivory films. Um, Ismail Merchant and James Ivory together. Um, it's they made a significant chunk of movies together. They worked with each other through their whole lives. Um, um, one is a director. The other is a producer, I believe. Yep. And one yep. of them, I think, also does music. I'm not sure which one. Anyway, um, but, uh, you know, this is one of those movies where in the catalog of Merchant Ivory films, I think this is one that kind of gets lost. Um, because For reason. <laughs> oh, you stop it. You stop it. <laughs> uh, but I haven't seen it in so long because I hadn't been able to find it. And while you were talking, I legit just found it finally. Um on Blu-ray. Can I make, can, can I recommend watching it on YouTube first before you decide to purchase it? <laughs> no, no, it's already in the box. It's already in the mail. Like I ordered it while we were talking. I look, I love Christopher Reeve. I will, you know, I have a, a what did you, what do you call it? A lifetime pass or what do you, um, a season pass to an season, actor yeah. uh, or I, I, a, a director. Yeah. yeah I definitely all have a season pass to, yeah. to Christopher Reeve. Um, uh, I actually own a piece of his Superman cape, like in a nice. box. Like it's, you know, I'm, I'm big. See? So you don't have any fresh memory of this film? Then. No, I don't. So I'm going to watch it as soon as it comes, and the, and the next month I will I will uh, okay All update right. you on my my uh, interests and yeah. Kyle, yes or no? Have you seen the Bostonians? I have not seen the Bostonians, but I had heard enough about the Bostonians to go. Yeah, no, this is not my kind of movie, <laughs> and this is this is this is a reflection to of how desperate Christopher Reeves really was to try to get out of being constantly recognized as Superman. And I think, you know, to be honest with you, I think that's something that haunted him his entire career. And he really didn't learn to accept it till towards the end of his life, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kyle, uh, don't waste your time, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you have to worry. Now, now, maybe, maybe if the people who made Downton Abbey made this, maybe I'd be a little bit more. See, Downton Abbey did it right. Downton Abbey yeah. did, did it right. You know, I yeah. haven't watched all of Downton Abbey, but they did it right. Uh, this, well, there's this a specific didn't... formula for Downton Abbey. That's the upstairs, downstairs. So there's a difference between an upstairs, downstairs film and just like a, a straight up. Period. My parents used to watch Upstairs Downstairs and I was too young at the time to even mm -hmm. even attempt it but yeah um yeah, yeah. it was right. it was kind of brought back into vogue with uh, Gosford Park uh, Robert Altman back in like yeah. 
93 yeah. or four. Yeah. Next film we've got is Electric Dreams. Now, this was a film that I discovered by accident before I started writing up these 80, 84 notes and stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, this sounds interesting. Uh, I, I think I was either, I think it was probably because of the actors in it, uh, specifically Virginia Matson. Uh, I was curious about this. And uh, this came out uh, in July, uh, made almost $2 million in its original theatrical run. And uh, it's basically like, I love the poster. It says, we'll always be together in electric dreams with original songs by Phil Oakley, Giorgio Amador, uh, Culture Club, Heaven 17, and Jeff Lynn. An artificially intelligent PC and his human owner find themselves in a romantic r rivalry over a woman. Miles buys himself a state-of-the-art computer that starts expressing thoughts and emotions after having champagne spilled on it. Things start getting out of hand when both Miles and Edgar, uh, as the computer calls it himself, fall in love with Madeline, the attractive neighbor. Uh, directed by Steve Barron, of course, uh, starring Lenny Von Dolm, Virginia Matson, and Maxwell Caulfield. Kyle, give us some trivia on Electric Dreams. Okay, before I drop some trivia, I just want to say something about this film. Little did they know in 1984 when they made this film that with AI the way it is now, this is happening on a nightly basis somewhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but I do have some interesting trivia for this movie. Um, as the voice of the computer, Bud Court had to deliver his entire performance from inside a box on the set. His co-stars were never allowed to see him during filming. The director was afraid that if the other performers associated a person to the voice, they would react to it as if they were talking to a human being instead of a computer. And the difference in the action reaction would show on camera. At the 56-minute moment in the dream musical sequence, Edgar, the computer, dreams of electric sheep jumping a fence while Miles dozes off to sleep. This is a reference, of course, to Philip K. Dick's science fiction novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, otherwise known for movie buffs as Blade Runner. Um, and this is the one I found the most intriguing. Virginia Madsen revealed in a 2011 interview with Kevin Pollack that she has bought the remake rights to this film but can't get any studio interested in making it. Virginia you might want to try now because I think we might be able to get it with the way technology is right now. <laughs> you can almost do like a little horror aspect to it as yeah. well. Right? Yeah. So um, yeah, they, the new movie uh, it's called um, Afraid. I think it, yeah. I just saw the trailer for it last night. Where it's it's a lot. So I wanted to find a copy of this film, uh, and I didn't realize when I bought it at the time that it was an 85 film. I think I got this in uh, 2023 or 2024, and I ended up finding a uh, overseas copy. As you can see, uh, yeah. there is some uh, um, non-American writing above it on the DVD, but I was able to watch it, and uh, I did enjoy the film, and it does look like a actual release. It doesn't look sus, <laughs> which is kind of cool. It's just from overseas. Uh, very kind of charming little film. Great soundtrack, by the way. Uh, a lot, a lot of other stuff that's not mentioned that I brought up earlier. And the the act, the main actor. I'm not a. I don't know a lot of stuff he's done. I know he's gone on to do behind the scenes stuff. But of course, Virginia Madsen is just adorable in this film. She's a musician as well. Uh, and there is some funny moments. In this. It's shot on location in um, uh, San Francisco. So it has its own charm there. There, One of my favorite scenes actually is when they go on a little tourist attraction to Alcatraz and they kind of take off on their own and have some uh, little fun adventure there. Uh, a cute film. I put it up on social media and uh, other people remembered it. I didn't think there's going to be some additions. And some people actually remembered watching this when it came out in the theater. Kyle, do you remember Electric Dreams and have you seen it? I've seen it. And like I said, it's been a good while. It was a movie I saw on HBO back in the day. And you know, again, this is the, 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 the interesting thing about this is it's really a kind of a period piece of how we thought about computers at that time and what 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 we were playing at with computers and what we were willing to kind of explore and have fun with computers with now. And again, I'm going to go back to what we live in in our world today. It's it's so much scarier. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is. It's, it's, but, I mean, it's scary to think that we are getting to a point where something that it was meant to be a comedy movie could be something that could maybe in ways happen in real life as we continue down the AI path and other things. It's, it's, it, it's, 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 it, it's, it's one of those, I just, yeah, you don't, your mind starts. Ide to Identity theft too is touched on a little bit is interesting. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite scene in the film, by the way, is when he, he's not a computer guy, even though he is a nerdy looking guy. 
but he gets sold the goods of how this is the thing now. And as we know, 82, 83 is when com home computers are becoming a thing and controls the security system and everything. It's very funny. Lacey, your thoughts on Electric Dreams? Did you ever see it? I feel like I have. I, I haven't seen it recently enough to have a rec any recollection of the actual film itself. I, I do agree that, you know, even in the past 10 to so 10 or so years I mean, we've got ultron you've got jexy that came out you've got be afraid with jexy love jexy <laughs> yeah you know like there's 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 been a lot of um since the reality of ai has kind of caught up with the sci-fi of ai um i mean you know look at 2001 yeah. You know, how? <laughs> well, well, you know. Excuse me, for, of course, we could bring up the whole Scarlett Johansson AI thing that's been going on. <laughs> <laughs> you went there, Kyle. <laughs> I don't know what's uh, happening. Apparently, I am behind the ball on this one. So That's all right. right. The, next, okay. the, the next film we're going to talk about is Revenge of the Nerds, made over $41 million in its uh, initial theatrical release. Uh, the poster says they've been laughed at, picked on, and put down. Now it's time for the odd to get even. Their time has come. They've been laughed at, picked on, of course, and their time is at Adams College, a group of bullied outcasts and misfits resol resolved to fight back for their peace and self-respect. Uh, of course, starring Robert Carradine and Anthony Edwards as the two main nerds, uh, followed by Timothy Busfield, Curtis Armstrong, Larry B. Scott, uh, Ted McGinley, of course, uh, being the jerk character he likes to be sometimes. Uh, he is, of course, uh, the, the lead of the, uh, the um, uh, what you call it, the jocks. Uh, we also have James Cromwell, the father of Robert Carradine. Uh, John Goodman and Bernie Casey, uh, respectively, make appearances here as well. Uh, and Michelle uh, May, May Rink, um, May Rink. May Rink. Am I saying that? Yeah. Uh, loved her in, um, what was it, uh, Real Genius? Real I remember Genius. Correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kyle, give us some trivia first. Okay, uh, some trivia. James Cromwell has said that when he came up with the nerd laugh after the other actors in, in uh, after the other actors used it, imitated. he later realized, he imitated, yeah. He realized while driving home from the studio on the first day of production, it was his ex-wife's laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> um, the other actors were... Per Protective of Andrew Cassie, who played Wormser, Wormser, and along with director Jeff Canoe, made sure that the young actor did not witness or play a main role in many of the scenes that earned the film its R rating. Cassie, however, was allowed to see the film when he was still well below 17 years old and was very surprised by what he missed during the filming. <laughs> um, Robert Carradine says that when he read the script, Lewis's laugh was described as a goose honk, but was not sure how to do it. However, by chance, that when the first scenes were shot of his father dropping Lewis and Gilbert off, when James Cromwell did the laugh, Carradine mimicked it. On the documentary for the special edition DVD, it was revealed that many of the actors, including Robert Carradine, Curtis Armstrong, and Timothy Busfield, initially did not want to do the film, but gave in because the movie either paid well or was a chance for some of them who were struggling actors to get into a movie. Now, Kevin, I have a hot take on this film. Please do. Quick. I don't think there is a cast that has been able to escape these the characters they played in a film more than Revenge of the Nerds. Because I think most, and what I mean by that is most of the cast is so identified with the characters they played in Revenge of the Nerds that even though they have had other things in Hollywood, people see them and they still see them as, as those characters or you see them cast in a version type of those characters outside of maybe Anthony Edwards and Timothy, Timothy Busfield. That is a good take. Uh, I would say not necessarily very hot, but definitely hot. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts on revenge of the nerds, Kyle. It, it's, it's a classic. Um, you know, the thing is, is I don't really, really remember it coming through the movie theaters. I remember it being huge when it hit on VHS and, and blockbuster and you can never, it was always, it was always checked out. I, but it was one of those movies, I think, especially for that time period. It was kind of a, a thing where it's like, yeah, we're getting we're getting one over here, and it just it was it was fun. It's 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 one of those '80s sex romp comedies as well. It, it's got a little bit of everything into it, and you know, it, they they did they did the sequel as well, Nerds in Paradise later on. I, I think it's I think it is one of those '80s films that is. It, it's a great 80s time capsule film. It's definitely I have the a time D capsule because that's this is definitely a boys will be boys film. 
Uh, it could not be made today. The ending of it, the actual revenge for Robert Carradine is legit rape. I'm just saying. Um, yeah, that that like, that part has not aged well. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and realistically, that shouldn't. I mean, <laughs> it shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have aged well or been received well in 1984. Um, but yeah, it's. I think that everything but that, and maybe the pie thing was just a little bit too much. But because when it comes to revenge on the dudes they were they got revenge on the jocks by using the women as playthings or, or chess pieces which is mm -hmm. so the whole i mean look funny movie back then whatever fine watched it recently and went oh no oh no no <laughs> it was just kind of like you like as someone who is a 50 year old woman Watching it back when I was, you know, probably 15 or 16. Oh, that's hilarious. Whatever. Watching it now, it's like, no, do not let your children see this. Do not raise your, your sons to, to <laughs> this is a terrible film. Um, yeah. Well, for me personally, I still find it, it, it for me, it, uh, at the time mm -hmm. it hit a certain chord because I, uh, myself, um, you know, saw myself as a couple of these characters, you know, uh, it was before I was like, my, I, I enjoyed the last two years of my high school. But the first two years sucked and especially junior high. Uh, and I, I felt, I felt the pain of these guys. And, uh, you know, probably the most famous scene in this movie is when uh, they win the competition. And of course do that great musical moment and the whole competition between, uh, you know, the nerds and the jocks was, was hilarious as well. Especially, you know, Booger winning the, the belching contest and stuff like that. Still funny. I remember seeing this. Uh, I think it was a drive-in, but I remember seeing it with not my family, with friends with older brothers that got me into seeing it, you know. And uh, I thought it was, uh, I think it's still one of the funniest movies. And yes, there's definitely parts that haven't aged well. But when I when I rewatched it recently, I was really kind of drawn to some of the, the characters and uh, what they were going through. And uh, I also too, I I have this revenge Revenge of the Nerds two Revenge of the uh, Revenge of the Nerds Revenge of the Nerds two uh, DVD thing here, and that's all I need really because there was a a thing that was happening with R rated films is that they were starting to become PG thirteen and PG with the sequels. They did it with, of course, Police Academy more famously, Revenge of the Nerds. They did it as well. Another film uh, we're going to talk about did it as well, and it wasn't necessarily like the the smartest choice. But in Revenge of the Nerds 2, we, we, Anthony Edwards is only in the beginning of it. I don't know if that was for contractual reasons, but I almost felt like he's like, I don't want to be in the rest of this film. The rest of the guys. Bingo. Can Bingo. He had a broken leg and he couldn't go. Right. <laughs> and, you know, and it's interesting, too, because um, when you look at the sequels, the uh, the other cast members did end up coming back, which I thought was interesting. And if you look at the sequels, uh, I think we have a Revenge of the Nerds. Um, there's, hold on, I have it here in a second. Uh, I think there's Revenge like four of the or five of them. At this yes, point. <laughs> and you you had like, um, uh, I think you had the girlfriend in the first film um, that Betty. She returns in the third and fourth films. Ted McGinley even returns as well. The only person that doesn't return, of course, is uh, Anthony Edwards because he's doing, of course, uh, some important ER. medical show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the other films. I think they went uh, directly to, uh, um, you know, either VHS or whatever it was. But uh, um, you know, there's moments in Revenge of the Nerds too. Uh, of course, you have a young Courtney Thorne Smith who's really cute in it, stuff like that. But it's not a great film. But uh, it still holds a special place in my heart because uh, I was feeling the pain some of these nerds were going through personally. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, All Kevin, right, guys. There, one, yep. one, one, one more quick thing. This movie does contain, as some of you might know, I have a thing where there are certain actors who are like, in their contract, they must be the coolest mf -er in the movie. Mm -hmm. Bernie, Ka Bernie Casey is the OG of the coolest mf -er in the movie. <laughs> lambda, lambda, <laughs> lambdas. Yeah. Uh, when the nerds were able to finally have a sponsor and join that, uh, Bernie Casey's great. He comes in and, and just kills it. And I love it when Bernie Casey comes to the party. <laughs> yeah. Party sucks at first until someone breaks out the weed. <laughs> I still laugh at that, you know. All right, guys. The next film we're going to discuss is The Never Ending Story. Never Ending Story, guys. 
you know, it took, I didn't see this when it first came out, by the way. It took me a while to see it. Uh, a boy who needs a friend finds a world that needs a hero in a land beyond imagination. A troubled boy dives into the wondrous fantasy world through the pages of a mysterious book. Bastion is a young boy who lives in a dreary life being tormented by school bullies. On one such occasion, he escapes into a bookshop where the old proprietor reveals an ancient storybook to him, which he is warned can be dangerous. Shortly after, he borrows the book and begins to read it from the school attic where he is drawn into the mythical land of Fantasia, which desperately needs a hero to save it from its destruction. Directed by Wolfgang Peterson, starring Noah Hathaway, Barrett Oliver, Tammy uh, Stronich, and Gerald McGraney. Kyle, give us some trivia on The Never Ending Story. Noah Hathaway was hurt twice during the making of this movie. While learning to ride a horse, he, his horse threw him off, then stepped on him. While shooting the drowning sequence in the Swamp of Sadness, his leg got caught on the elevator and he was pulled underwater. He was unconscious by the time he was brought to the surface. However, it gets worse for him. He almost lost an eye during a fight scene versus Gronk. One of the claws on the, his giant paws poked him in the face. The robot was also so heavy that he lost his breath as well when he was hit to the ground by it. They only made one shot due to the risk that this he would get seriously wounded. Um, interesting note, this was made with a budget of 50 million Deutschmarks, about $27 million. This was the most expensive film ever produced in Germany at the time. And for those of you who might be interested, you can ride on Falkor's back on location at the Bavaria Film Park, Munich, Germany. Um, one other quick note on this, Kevin. Disney has recently announced they are remaking the never-ending story in a two-film, two-part film series. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, well, I just want to let you too. I actually have the, the double feature on the DVD here. Uh, I remember watching the second one, uh, but I don't remember it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the third one is uh, notorious for being Jack Black's first movie. He was, a, he was a bully in the third one. He had like a one line or something in the third one. Well, L Lacey, what is your thoughts on the never ending story? Um, I think that Gen X, I think this is a very specific point of trauma for Gen what? X. <laughs> Wait, 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 Why wait, wait. is that? <laughs> it's, it's, there, there was a reason I gave a warning at the beginning I, of the podcast. I know. <laughs> so, and, and I, I have actually, okay, speaking of the photo that you have on the screen right now. Okay. I actually have seen a, oh, it's, it's for a plant. Okay. You're, it, it, it's basically like the top half of a tray you and the top half of our tax. And you're supposed to put it in the, in your, in a plant, like a potted plant. Like it looks like. <laughs> The, the swamp and it's just like so why would you have a plant like the plant of death it's just huh. and the whole so our, our our tax is the horse of the main character to yeah. you in a children's novel here and this is the swamp of sadness scene yes. where the horse just gives up and apparently dies and dies and the thing is that it's not just that i mean the whole the whole thing starts because his mother passed away and so he's running from the bullies and then so He's got like the death of a parent. He's being bullied. He escapes into a place where he's reading all this stuff about a, a, a princess who can't cry. And the, 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 the big bad is called the nothing. So it's just, it's kind of like there are so, and I know Wolfgang Peterson uh, directed it, but that's a whole different thing. Cause whatever. But um, there's a, there's a paper that I wrote uh, that I read, sorry, did not write this paper. Um, Back in film school, I read this paper where the nothing is was com was uh, uh, compared like as an allegory to suicide, like the whole mm. and, and you're and I'm reading this paper and I'm like, oh my god, it is <gasps> like all these things, you know, all the things that he comes up against and the whole like it's nuts if you look at it as an adult and yeah. watching it as a kid, I was like traumatized by this movie. Like, how dare you kill the horse? What were you thinking? It's like there's a yeah. that there's a book called Don't Kill the Dog, and it's like a screenwriting like rule book, you know. And, and then, there's a website, you know, does the dog die? And that that right? really kind of came to fruition with Turner and Hooch. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this movie. And the thing is, the, the other thing is, that, like, nothing is actually resolved at the end of this film. Oh. Like, realistically. Yeah. No. Kyle, your thoughts on Never Ending Story? So. 
the big debate for people of our age is what was the more traumatic event, the never ending story or the death of Optimus Prime? <laughs> those, are, those are like the two biggest traumatic events on kids in movies. Optimus Prime is period. robot. Our tax is a horse, a, ho yeah, a living being. I understand that, but Optimus Prime was also the father figure for a lot of kids during that no, time. Man, frame. But, it's a lot. But the, the, the thing about this movie is visually this movie is stunning. The effects mm. in this movie are great. The, the creature designs are incredible. Yeah. But I so agree with Lacey. I remember watching this and going, this story makes no sense. It's not going anywhere. This is just depressing as hell. Um, and really, even even the ending, even though it's meant to be a happy ending, it just feels like it's an ending. There's not yeah. You're, you're like, you're like, okay, so uh, uh, what just happened? Um, th th this is this is a movie that it has a huge cult following, and I understand it completely. It's right up there, I think, in the cult followings when you talk like Labyrinth and Dark Crystal. But for me, with this movie, the never-ending story was never one of my favorites. Again, I will watch it for the visuals any any time. But just as far as just sitting it through the whole thing, I, I just I don't I don't. So, see it. I remember saying it a long, 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 long time ago, and then I was just like, there was something that didn't sit with me, and I couldn't remember the reason why, and it wasn't until I. Uh, something came up about Falcor and how cute that the beast looks. And Camille was interested in watching it. So I found it on this DVD with uh, the second one and uh, this one right here. And I said, Oh, well, let's watch it together. And keep in mind, Camille was a huge fan of horses and my little ponies. And boy, I might've traumatized her because <laughs> it was wow. sad for me. Uh, and I haven't been able to rewatch this film because of, of that. I just there's just certain yeah. scenes I just I just can't watch for whatever reason. So. It's like it's nostalgic, uh, but it's painful. Yeah, it's it is. that it thing is. where you have those like you have that kind of those heartstring moments, but at the same time, do we want to relive those heartstring moments? Yeah, Ugh. there's some you just got to pick and choose, uh, right. and that's not one. So yeah. And and I, I will say that during a convention not too long ago, I I found a, an artist who did like mashups, and you could ask him to do any mashup you wanted. And so I had him paint me a fantastic, like twenty by thirty inch, um, Groot baby Groot riding Falcor. Nice. Well, um, I speaking of cons, real quick, I do want to mention uh, Dragon Con about five or six years ago. It was one of my last Dragon Cons that I went to. Um, I don't know if what a parent put up the kid to this or not, but now that Dragon Con has that new brown carpet, oh, uh, God, there was this. some young kid <laughs> who is dressed up as, um, uh, what's his name? Atre Atreyu. Uh, Atre Atreyu and had a horse's head and was pulling him. <laughs> People were like, no, but I got to get a selfie. No, I got to get a picture. I saw him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. If you, if you search for it at Dragon Con, you'll see that pop up. All right, guys, a next film I don't want to spend a lot of time on. <laughs> this is the Corsican Brothers, Cheech and Chong. Uh, made just over $3 million here. Uh, the poster says they saw Paris, they saw France, they saw the queen in her underpants. Cheech and Chong's the Corsican Brothers. Uh, the, uh, the twins, Louis and Lucian, can feel pain from each other's injuries, revolt against the tyrannical regent who holds France under his iron fist. Directed, directed by uh, Cheech and Chong, starring, of course, Cheech and Chong. Also, a uh, brief uh, mention, a brief scene with Radon Chong, the daughter of Chong, and Shelby Chong. Uh, I, guys, I'm just going to say I tried watching this. It, it Let me just say that it did. I did reach the quota for my uh, <laughs> my letterbox. Uh, I, I ended up having the rest of it kind of just play in the background. Uh, this movie does one thing that a lot of R-rated uh, movies are doing is it went PG-13. I think they were trying to cater to young boys that couldn't or wouldn't couldn't officially see their earlier films that their parents didn't already bring them into it. And it is just they tried to be funny and silly and, uh, you know, preteen comedy or teen comedy. And it just didn't work for me. It was horrible. Any yeah, this, short comments on Corsican Brothers? <laughs> uh, this is this is. A bad movie, and it's a reason why it's one of their last, their era of Cheech and Chong movies. Um, yeah, there, there's not much to say about this, but I, after Lacey gives her thoughts, I, I do have a question. All right, short comments, Lacey. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one of those things that these two guys are known for doing a very specific type of comedy. They can do it in the Valley in L.A. They can do it in, you know, the different you know, each, and then all of a sudden they were like, why not do like a 17th century Regency France? 
No, it doesn't translate. Now, funny, yes. Ridiculous, absolutely. Inappropriate, 100%. Didn't um, find any fun. At, nothing was funny in this film, except for the oh. opening scene when they bring up their little band to play in the somewhere oh. in Paris and, and people were paying them to not play. Uh, Kyle, you, you said you had a question? What? Did you make it to the end? No, I, I zoned out because uh, um, I was getting ready for the show and then all of a sudden Yellowbeard came on. It became a little more interesting. <laughs> oh, okay. There's a point where because they can feel each other's pain, but they can't feel their own pain. They literally have a fight by punching them. And kill, like <laughs> That's the funniest part of the whole movie. They have a fight by punching themselves. So, so question: does this go into your question, Kyle, that I'm thinking you're going to ask? Okay. So, so my question is this, because this was kind of the end of the Cheech and Chong era. Who has gone on to have a better career since in, in film? Let me put it in film and television. Who do you feel has gone on to have a better career? Because I'm going to be honest with you, my opinion is Cheech Marin. I think well, Cheech, Marin yeah. Uh, he also got into the Tarantino uh, film there and also had that run with uh, Don Johnson in his TV series. And but then you, then you had uh, Tommy come in during the 70s show where he played What's His Name's Father. Right, uh, but and Chong uh, Chi Chart also did like some Pixar stuff. Like he's got some Pixar. Oh, I mean, yeah. he did. He actually did a couple comedies after that, though. He did Born in East LA and Shrimp on the Barbie. And he was so. hilarious in uh, Tin Cup with um, Ray Russo and uh, Kevin uh, Costner. Shrimp Ray on the Barbie, yeah. underrated comedy film. I really do enjoy. Uh, yeah, Kyle, yeah. The, the question I was hoping you would have asked is who who came up with the twins being able to feel themselves getting hit. First, was it Cheech and Chong or was it the uh, the Crimson Twins in GI Joe? Uh, it was Cheech and Chong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right, guys. The final film we're going to spend some time on because it deserves a couple minutes here. That is, of course, Purple Rain, uh, made over sixty eight million dollars. This was Prince's, uh, you know, of course, grand. Like here I am. This is it. You're going to buy my movie. You're going to buy my songs. And and he was on top of the world. A young musician tormented by an abusive situation at home was contend with a rival singer, a burgeoning romance in his own dissatisfied band as his star begins to rise. Directed by Albert Mangoli. Of course, stars Prince, Apollonia, Morris Day, and the F and Time. Uh, Kyle, give us some trivia on this. Now, first of all, Kevin, you must quote the great muse, Jay, properly. It's Morris Day and the M Mother F and Time. <laughs> I was close to a cigar. The greatest band of all time. Now, come on. Um, bring on with some jungle love. That's all I'm saying. Um, trivia. A few days before the premiere, Prince had a nightmare that Gene Siskel and Robert Roger Ebert despised the film with Ebert ripping the film apart. He said, I dreamed those two guys on the TV were reviewing the movie and that fat guy was tearing me up. Siskel and Ebert both loved the film in their reviews, however. Um, scenes of Wendy and Lisa kissing suggesting a same-sex relationship were deleted from the final version. In real life, they were in a relationship. The audio from the three songs in the final concert, which included I Would Die For You, Baby I'm a Star, and the title song Purple Rain, were recorded live on August 3rd, 1983 at the First Avenue Club in Minneapolis, uh, in Minneapolis as part of a fundraiser from the Minnesota Dance Theater. It, was all, it also marked the official debut of Prince's new band, The Revolution. The concert's Scenes were reenacted later. And of course, Princess of Protege, Vanity, was originally slated to be cast as the kid's love interest. She left the film prior to shooting, and the group Vanity Six became Apollonia Six. Someone here might own that album. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, their song appeared in Beverly Hills Cop, too, as well. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start with you, Lacey. Your thoughts on Purple Rain? Okay, I to this day don't think I've ever actually seen Purple Rain. I do have a fun uh, anecdote about Morris Day and the Time. Uh, in Please 20, do. In 2010, they were one of the, they were like the opening, or not the opening, they were the final act for the Georgia Peach Drop, the Atlanta Peach Drop on New Year's Eve. And uh, David Keckner was the MC. Nice. And you know how David. Morris Day, like during their sh during their show, th they have the guy that brings the mirror out, and he like you know looks at himself yep. in the mirror, and does all this. Okay, so um, I was on stage with them during the Peach Drop for the whole like the whole. I mean, there's like four or five different bands, um, but I got to be on stage and hang out and like chill with David Keckner and do all the things and push the button and all the you know whatever. Um, but uh, the best part of that night was being able to take a picture in Morris Day's mirror. Like oh, I, that's so I have cool. a picture of, of, yeah, yeah. So that was fun. 
Kyle, your thoughts on Purple Rain? You know how we always have those superstar singers that, you know, have to put themselves in a movie because they just feel like they should. And that's what Prince <laughs> did here. Luckily, it kind of worked for him. And because he was, it's Prince and just people will just roll with it. Um, it's definitely got its unique place in Hollywood history. Um, hearing Lacey, though, talk about the whole Morris Day thing with the mirror, Kevin, I just had Ready Player Two flashbacks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, he was uh, Prince. Prince was, um, in my opinion, and and he's one of my favorite artists of all time. I remember uh, winning a uh, um, uh, a radio ad where I won a CD a week for an entire year. It was in the '90s, early '90s, and um, the Prince rare uh, hits and rare B sides was a double CD thing. So I had to that had to take up two of my weeks to get it, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, Prince, one of the uh, most um, fantastic musicians of all time he can he can record all the parts of his album play all the instruments on it and then get these wonderful bands to back him up and stuff and obviously he reinvented himself uh, with contract issues and gave himself the symbol um one of the most underrated guitar players of all time as well being um, a former musician myself i've always appreciated his musicianship and his style uh, and this movie really, really hit a chord with pop culture and fans in general. And this, he just blew up after this. He's basically playing himself. Uh, the people in his band are the same names in real life and stuff. But that's what kind of made it cool. It's like you were almost watching a live documentary of this guy who is on the rise. He was already popular, but his stardom just went through the roof because of this. And it was just, it was a cool concept. You know, you had a little bit of drama going on with uh, him and the rival band, Morris Day, which a lot of people might say they prefer the Morris Day scenes. And I love Morris Day in the time. Uh, but um, I, I rewatched it and uh, I, I enjoyed it, but there were some scenes though that were bugging me. Like obviously there's the tough scenes of his parents always, uh, you know, um, fighting and it's referenced and when doves cry and then of course his father ends up shooting himself um but the scenes that bug me though is when he's slapping apollonia around i did those just don't sit with me anymore it's tough to watch um but uh you know getting into the music and the other drama side though it, it is entertaining and uh in a way it still holds up because of the music that music is timeless and so purple rain will uh definitely as probably one of the best music Movies of all time, Kyle? Uh, I would say so, but uh, let me ask you this, Kevin. Uh, Vanity, one of the worst career decisions ever? What, to do this film? To, 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 drop, to out. Drop, drop out of this film. Uh, yeah, probably. She she obviously went on to do some acting and stuff, and uh, she actually is in a, actually a good episode of Highlander, the TV series. Uh, you know, yeah, it was one of those things, you know, she, she did her thing and she took a chance and maybe didn't pay off for whatever reason, but... Uh, you know, Prince had some interesting relationship with fellow musicians uh, throughout his life and uh, also uh, wrote Manic Monday for the Bengals. A lot of people don't realize a lot of the stuff that he wrote that he not necessarily recorded, but he might have done during a live show. And one of my biggest regrets is not going to a small club to see him back in 2004, 2005, because I thought um, $75 for a ticket was too much. Back then it was. <laughs> yeah definitely definitely all right guys let's go ahead and wrap things up here uh, of time warp 1984 in july all right we had some top grossing movies uh nothing in this particular month made it because most of them were last month uh, which is interesting here. Uh, but we are loving uh, the uh, summer months of July of 1984, guys. And uh, I just want to kind of get your final thoughts of this month before we wrap things up. Lacey. I think this is a really fun month. Um, it had, uh, it had, you know, a couple of my favorites, you know, Last Starfighter, Muppets. Uh, can't, can't, can't look at that badly. It's going to yeah. be good. Yeah, it was good. Kyle. This is this is interesting. I think because of the time frame too, Kevin, and we've kind of talked about this. The how to find at this point the summer movie season was. You had everything hitting really May, June, July, and that was kind of considered the big summer movie season. August was kind of like okay, we've got a few more we need to sneak out, but we're, we're pretty much wrapping up summer movie season now. Thanks to Fast and the Furious and so many things, the summer movie season starts like in March and goes through April. Probably. Yeah, Mar yeah, yeah, you're right. March, yeah, Mar March, and goes through maybe even like 
beginning October. of September now. <laughs> no, I would say I would say the beginning of September is probably where people start kind of switching out of it finally. Yeah. So I think I think as we, it's going to be an interesting experiment as we go forward with the rest of these time wars to see how drastically the style of movie change, starts changing as we get deeper into the the year of 1984. Because um, hmm. if if you if you look at it, all the top grossing films I believe we've now covered in the first within the first six months of time yeah. war. And so yeah. this is just a great example of how movies were treated at the time and how they did it. And I think it's going to be fun the rest of the way. I'm glad you just made that comment about how we've already kind of covered the top grossing movies, because what's funny is they're, they're still in the theater while these new films we're talking about are coming out. Yeah. <laughs> That's because these today, movies where they're... stayed in the theater for like six months, sometimes yeah. a year or re-released. Unlike today where they're on streaming within three weeks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, I wonder if we're going to notice in the pop culture and the, like politically and just residentially, like what, what happened in the latter half of 1984 that made people maybe not go to the movies as much. I mean, obviously there it's possible that the movies didn't weren't of the, the right caliber to, to draw the crowds, but there's also, you know, when you talk about six full months of not having one of the top top grossing films i mean that's when it wasn't like the um like there was a there was a bunch of like hijackings in the, the later half of this year right and lots of things like where people were just like so stressed out that they just kind of like went inward what, one, one of the things you'll start to notice when we start getting i'm going to tease in a minute here um mm -hmm. what's happening next month but you're mm -hmm. going to get a lot of cult favorite films you're going to get a lot of films that did better on home video uh, right. And that that gained popularity and nostalgia a little bit later. Uh, but before I tease that, though, this is the Fandom Podcast Network. Time Warp 1984 is what we're teasing here. But uh, Kyle, uh, people want to reach out to you. How can we find you? Uh, of course, you can find me all over the Fandom Podcast Network, while being on many of the shows. And of course, on our Fandom Podcast Network Facebook page as well. If you want to follow me personally, you can follow me on Twitter at a Kyle W. You can also follow me on Discord, Discord at a Kyle W. If you want to follow me on Instagram and Fred, you can follow me at a Kyle fandom. Lacey, where can we find you? And there in your, uh, your movie Funis. Uh, I am Lacey pants on all the places, uh, except for Instagram where I am the Lacey pants. And when I say all the places I'm including like blue sky and threads and, um, t uh, discord and all the, all the places. X. Yeah. yeah. Uh, X Lacey and, pants. Uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, letterboxd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All the places. Letterboxd. Awesome. Uh, you can find me in all of those places at Spartan underscore Phoenix, uh, X Instagram, uh, letterbox, of course, discord and, uh, threads. Uh, now teasing what's coming up next uh, is the movies of August of 1984 part eight, as we're doing these monthly now. And, uh, a couple of the ones I have here, of course, on the, uh, the, the picture and the cover art is Buckaroo Banzai, Across the Eighth Dimension, Red Dawn, Cloak and Dagger, Sheena, Dreamscape, and Chud, otherwise known as Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. We also have Granville, USA, The Joy of Sex, uh, The Philadelphia Experiment, uh, The Woman in Red, Old Enough, Tightrope, Oxford Blues, Choose Me, Bolero, and Flashpoint. And in this picture here, Kyle, um, I'm going to just say tease right now. One of these movies I purchased on DVD accidentally twice. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I know why, which one it might be, but I will save my guess for the next episode. But okay. Kevin, I just want to say Pretty looking sure. at these films, this is already exercising the point of how many of these films really didn't succeed that well in the theater, but found such their niche in VHS and HBO and things like that. That that's where people jumped onto a lot of these films and, Kevin, I know you were a Tanya Roberts fan. Talk about that later. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lacey, thank you so much, as always. Kyle, my brother, thank you so much. This is the Movies of 1984 here on the Fandom Podcast Network. Uh, celebrating July. Long show, I know, but we had a lot to get into and uh, apologize for spending 30 minutes on Santa Barbara. Uh, <laughs> again, thank you, Lacey. Thank you, Kyle. This has been Time Warp 1987, or excuse me, 1984 Part 7. Uh, and until next time, guys, we will see you back in time. <laughs>